We'll have a panel discussion between 11.35 and 55, and have closing remarks from my dear friend, Dr. Kugumas at 11.55. This meeting could not have taken place without our important sponsors. Um, these are our platinum sponsors, uh, Intercept, Madrigal, Ibsen, and Manicroft. We couldn't have done it without them and very appreciative of their support. We also have a, a list of gold sponsors, um, Salix in particular, and then a, a large list of uh, silver sponsors that you can see here as well. So we thank all our sponsors for their commitment um, for patient physician education uh, and patient advocacy. I want to also highlight that we have a number of uh, symposia. This is a non-CME given by my colleague, Gina Troy from UCLA, talking about the optimization of treatment pathways for people with primary biliary cholangitis. She's a wonderful speaker. I think you enjoy her talk. Uh, and then we have a very special CME special tonight uh, by two of our, our esteemed colleagues, Dr. Kugamas and Dr. Persepolis, looking at uh, optimizing and introducing recent HRS AKI advances in clinical care. As you know, we're going through a major revolution in our paradigm of treating AKI. Uh, and this will be a very, very exciting talk. And I'm pleased to join us for this meeting at 7 p.m. This is sponsored by Educational Grant by Melico Pharmaceuticals. So some housekeeping, uh, please utilize a microphone in the middle of the ballroom. We also have question and answer cards in front of you. We have approximately 300 people on the virtual platform. Uh, if you have questions on the virtual platform, please submit your questions for the question and answer section on the live stream viewer. We will make sure we get to them one by one. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna invite Dr. Rostogi up here, who's gonna introduce uh, the next day's speakers. Thank you, everybody. Morning, everybody. I wanted to add my thanks to Chronic Liver Disease Foundation and our uh, sponsors for making this possible. I understand there are 500 people registered and 300 virtual, so that's sizable. Uh, uh, this first session is on the complications of cirrhosis. Uh, the first speaker is uh, I take particular pride in as he uh, just finished his PhD a few years ago with us. Mohammed Al Saeed is going to talk about healthcare and the cost burden of cirrhosis. We always hear there's 600,000 cirrhotics in the United States. Hopefully, he'll convince you. I mean, it seems like I see that many in my clinic every day that there that it's actually a much more prevalent problem than we recognize. Um, Mohammed is a PhD in uh, epidemiology. He's now at um, Ohio State in the Comprehensive Cancer Center, which he informs me is the second largest in the country. So. Mohammed, please. Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you all for uh, being here early this morning, and uh, thanks to the Chronic Liver Disease Foundation for the invitation and uh, for the sponsors. Uh, I uh, will talk today about uh, healthcare and cost burden of cirrhosis, a problem that I been working on for uh, many, many, many years. And uh, I will be talking about uh, the epidemiology and the changes in the dynamics of cirrhosis and its uh, related compensation uh, outcomes. Um, and then we'll touch a little bit about what's the current status and trend of the uh, cirrhosis healthcare utilization, economic burden, and then uh, we'll end with some conclusions or future remarks. Uh, so, uh, as you see here, globally, uh, cirrhosis is the 11th uh, most uh, common cause of death, uh, with two, uh, 2 million deaths happening on average every year, 1 million of which is directly due to cirrhosis. Uh, in the United States, uh, chronic liver disease is ranked the ninth uh, cause of death. Uh, it used to be ranked the eighth, but now uh, COVID-19 is ranked third, so uh, liver disease is uh, ranked ninth. Uh, we also want to highlight that it's the third biggest cause of death in uh, individuals ages between 45 and 64 years of age. Cirrhosis combined with hepatocellular carcinoma globally accounts for 3.5% of all death annually. Uh, this here highlights the problem and kind of a good news, bad news, where you see here the counts and age adjusted. So the, the bars are signifying the counts of death. Uh, between 1990 and the year 2017. 
where the blue uh, the blue bars highlighting the actual count of death due to uh, cirrhosis um, for men, and then the ones in pink is for uh, females. And then as you see, the count is going up due to increase in population. Uh, you see the age adjusted, which is the good news, the age adjusted rate of death uh, related to cirrhosis are dropping uh, significantly uh, in both men and women. Now to the United States, how's the trend looking when it comes to death? As I mentioned, chronic liver disease is the ninth leading cause of death in the United States. Um, in 2021, there was about 50, 57,000 deaths due to chronic liver disease, and that excludes uh, liver-related cancers. Uh, it's about 1.63% of all deaths, with about 17 per 100,000 uh, deaths taking place. And as you see here, the trend is increasing uh, on the left panel. The trend of death in this uh, pink uh, uh, trend line, which is the combined death due to chronic liver disease cirrhosis. Uh, you see that the, 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 the link is that the, the trend is increasing and underneath these are the underlining causes. So this is the breakdown of the etiology specific cause of death when it comes to cirrhosis. On the second panel, which is also a very important metric to look into, which is the daily adjusted life years. We see also the burden on the daily, uh, the, the, the population from uh, a life quality of living uh, metric is also increasing with uh, kind of a modest dip towards the end between the years 2015 and 2016. And as you see on the bottom as well, uh, the, the biggest driver uh, for the death uh, when it comes to percentage-wise is uh, hepatitis C-related death. And uh, the data we have is up to 2017 in this case. So uh, we're, we're hoping that the updated data will have less of a burden due to the advancement in treatment of, uh, of uh, hepatitis C. Now we'll talk about the prevalence of disease by radiology. And as Dr. Rudsky mentioned, uh, there's always the 600,000, sometimes 900,000. Uh, we do believe the number is much, much bigger. The, the bars that you see here is combined chronic liver disease and cirrhosis. And that's the problem. The metric accounts for both. We don't have uh, population level data from, from the CDC or from NIH that actually looks into cirrhosis by itself. So it's almost combined with chronic liver disease, which predominantly includes NASH, uh, fibrosis and advanced fibrosis and so on. But the trend here, as you see from 1990 is increasing up to the year 2019, whereby the prevalence was about 11%. Now we're crossing 14 and percent going on 15%. And if you look in the distribution of each bar, you can, you can see that NAFLD is the biggest driver of this increase whereby accounted for 8.9%. Uh, and then with uh, the increases in the obesity burden and so on, it now accounts for 13.2% of the combined prevalence of 14.8%. We see also that other causes are flat. Um, when it comes to hepatitis C, it ranges between 1% in 1990 and then 1.2% 1 in 2019. And, and same trend for hepatitis B, uh, alcohol use, and other causes. Now, if we look at the prevalence itself and what accounts for it, so that's the distribution with each column accounting for 100%. To look at the trend, how is the etiology dynamics changes over time when it comes to cirrhosis and chronic liver disease? And as you see here, the, uh, the share of NAFLD cirrhosis is, oh, I'm sorry, the, the share of NASH uh, NASH fibrosis, uh, chronic liver disease burden went from 8 82% to 87% in 2019. And you see uh, hepatitis C dropping from 9.6 to 8.2. And also we see the burden of hepatitis B is dropping, accounting for 5% of the complete uh, prevalence of cirrhosis and CLD, uh, and then dropping to 2 0.4%. So what I want to highlight from those graphs is that the disease etiology is changing, the population dynamics are changing, and the trend is going up. And we ought to really look care carefully at trying to better understand the true burden of cirrhosis itself. 
given that the obesity burden is really increasing and significantly impacting the disease dynamics. And as, as we all know, a lot of patients are not diagnosed with cirrhosis or diagnosed in late, late disease stages due to uh, the uh, disease manifestation. Now I'm gonna move into a little bit to talk about the healthcare and cost of cirrhosis in the United States. And my focus will be on inpatient settings in a utilization and uh, both total cost and per person cost, so direct cost to patients. Uh, the first thing I wanna highlight, so these are numbers related to cirrhosis alone, not, not combined with chronic liver disease. And as you see on the, on the, uh, on the lift panel, these are hospital admissions or inpatient, inpatient stays directly due to cirrhosis. So these are the weighted count from the National, uh, uh, the national Inpatient Surveys. <clears throat> From 2016 to 2020, we see uh, close to uh, 120,000 uh, in hospital admissions due to cirrhosis. And uh, the vast majority or the bigger proportion of those numbers, as you see here, the bar broken by non-alcoholic versus alcoholic. So the proportion of alcoholic is higher than the non-alcoholic, and then it's increasing over time, uh, reaching 120,000. And these are weighted numbers. Uh, to reflect on the, uh, the United States population. That's principal diagnosis. So this is directly due to cirrhosis. On the other panel, you see uh, a much higher number, and this uh, signifies cirrhosis being listed as one of the underlying causes of the inpatient stays. And you see here uh, an increase between 2016 up to 2018, and then uh, it flattened in 2020, uh, reaching about Eight, eight, 800,000 inpatient uh, stays annually. The distribution of discharges uh, for females and males, and as you see here in the middle, routine means routine discharge. So 64% of male are routinely discharged um, versus 61% in females. Against medical advice is double in men versus women. Uh, with 4% versus 2%, 27% of men uh, are discharged to other medical facilities, uh, where 32% of female are discharged to uh, other uh, medical facility. And unfortunately, 5% of men dies uh, uh, during a hospital stay versus 4% in females. If we look at inpatient stays by demographics that are important to us, such as age group, uh, we see a, a very uh, distinct differences between the discharge rate per age group, whereby the biggest or the highest rate group uh, who gets discharged is the 45 to 64. As you remember, in my first slide, I showed that uh, globally, this group, uh, had chronic liver disease accounts for the third cause of this in this group. And, and we see the same issue in the United States with, high, with higher in hospital discharges in this group. The distribution of discharges, 54% or 55% of all discharges related to uh, cirrhosis happens within this age group. Length of stay is uh, not very different between the lower end of the distribution with 5.9 in those 18 to 44, uh, reaching five in those 85 years or above. In hospital, death is highest as you would expect in the oldest group and lowest in the youngest group, 18 to 44. Uh, we're talking about AD visit resulting in hospital admission. Uh, we look in the lift uh, panel here, and this is the rate of uh, ED visit per 100,000. And we've seen both increase in, in the ED admissions resulting in hospitalization with cirrhosis being the underlying cause and also uh, all listed. So it's listed within all the other causes as well. The number of AD per, uh, the uh, admissions, hospital admissions also is on the rise in both those who uh, have direct cirrhosis uh, related admissions and those who have underlining cause uh, with cirrhosis being one of them as well. So you see here on the left, we're reaching about 1.3 million uh, ED visits resulting in, in hospital admission. Uh, with with cirrhosis being one of the listed causes, so that I'm I'm hoping to convey that the trend is increasing, which means the disease prevalence and incidence also is changing. Otherwise, 
how would people be diagnosed with this higher rate uh, over a very long period of time? In this case, it's five years. Uh, cirrhosis readmission rates are considerably high. So about 4% uh, will be readmitted within seven days uh, for any cause, but 11.5% will be admitted for uh, same cause, which is cirrhosis. Uh, the same goes with the 30 days readmission as well with 30.8% uh, being uh, readmitted for same cause. Inpatient economic burdens, we'll talk a little bit about money. Uh, so in this graph here, which was staggering to me, and I even do this kind of research, uh, the aggregate hospital charges in the United States related to cirrhosis, chronic liver disease on the left is, this is in the billions, $12 billion. Dollars, it's just, just inpatient charges. And the aggregate hospital cost, which is the, the trend line, uh, is crossing to 20 billion. So that's 2,000, 2 billion, I'm sorry, 2,000 million. So it's 2 billion. On the other uh, panel, we look at the average charges and cost per stay. We see a very, very big increase between 2016 and 2020. Uh, with these bars signifying that the average cost uh, and charge is also increasing 15,000. We're crossing 15,000 going to uh, 19,000 per stay. And that mimic also uh, the in-hospital uh, cost per, per stay as well. Now, uh, I would like to highlight also the burden to the patient. So this study was done in 2015 where they looked at the cost uh, of cirrhotic patients before and after being diagnosed with different kind of decomposition events and comparing the uh, patients with alcoholic cirrhosis versus non-alcoholic cirrhosis. And as you see here, the average annual cost for uh, alcoholic cirrhosis post-diagnosis is about $44,800, uh, whereas the non-alcoholic is $23,000. And if we account for patients who have uh, compensated events such as SITs, uh, hepatic encephalopathy, and so on, we see a staggering increase, as you see here, of, of cost that it's very, very distinct between cirrhotic, for cirrhotic with alcoholic-related uh, cirrhotic cirrhosis versus non-alcoholic-related cirrhosis. Uh, this is a paper that we did looking at just hepatic encephalopathy alone. And as you see here, the mean and the median cost uh, per stay for patients uh, related to directly hepatic encephalopathy is is on the rise, reaching about forty four thousand uh, dollars mean cost in two thousand fifteen. Um, unfortunately, it, the data we wanted to update this, but the, uh, the 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 survey itself changed the way they asked the questionnaires, and also it's been challenging to work on hepatic encephalopathy with the ICD ten. Uh, changes as well to diagnose it from EHR records, but we're working on updating these results as well. And we, we do believe that hepatic encephalopathy is actually a, a big driver of cost burden within the uh, uh, cirrhotic patients. So uh, future remarks or uh, conclusions. When we talk about utilization, um, I hope I demonstrated that the overall trend is increasing, uh, showing uh, multiple different metrics. Uh, we've also looked into the difference between uh, cirrhosis from alcoholic causes or non-alcoholic causes, we see that alcohol is the main driver of inpatient admissions uh, uh, specifically. And we're also saying that we, we're seeing that the dynamics of, of disease is changing, and that will impact how patients interact with the healthcare provider and the healthcare system in general. When it comes to economic burden, we, we've shown that the burden is increasing, whether you look at the cost or charges or to the patient or by etiology to the patient. We also see the alcoholic cirrhosis when it comes to decompensated events is a main driver of a significantly higher cost burden to the patient and the healthcare system. So we think that the severity of decompensated event is, is a very big driver in the future for both mortality, morbidity, and health-related quality of life along with cost. Thank you.
So we're going to hold questions until the panel discussion. Um, please remember to uh, uh, use the cards at your desk for submitting Q and A, and from home, uh, putting them on the uh, on the chat session, as well as uh, the mics will be open during the panel discussion. Uh, our next speaker will cover the topic of altered mental status in a patient with cirrhosis and how to proceed. This is Dr. Robert Brown, who's the Vincent Astor Distinguished Professor of uh, Medicine. And I think as far as altered mental status, I guess, uh, has the expertise. Perfect. We can hear. Um, I have to not hear you because my, otherwise I create an interminable echo. But I'm really sorry that I'm not there. Um, I'm stranded, if you can use the word stranded, in Aspen, uh, where we got 14 inches of snow. Um, but I'm on my way. I will see you all tomorrow morning. Um, but I am pleased that I can at least uh, join you for this and for the panel discussion uh, remotely uh, on altered mental status uh, in a patient with cirrhosis, uh, how to proceed. So the first thing we think is um, in any patient with cirrhosis is about hepatic encephalopathy. And obviously hepatic encephalopathy will not only be the diagnosis we have to think about, it is also um, the can't miss diagnosis uh, because prompt treatment is needed. However, other causes of altered mental status can also occur in patients with cirrhosis. And so making the appropriate clinical diagnosis is important. Um, it starts with clinical findings and medical history, in particular, the recognition that the patient has cirrhosis and likely has portosystemic shunting. When they have marked portal hypertension, that's usually pretty easy, but oftentimes they can have mild resistive portal hypertension, but a lot of spontaneous shunting. Um, the ER and our neurology colleagues often like to depend on ammonia levels, but ammonia levels are both unreliable based on the way they're collected, particularly if it's a venous ammonia, and it has a very poor correlation with the actual um, diagnosis of HE. As a result, in all of our guidelines, measurement of ammonia is not recommended. Yet, I'm sure all of you in your clinics um, as well as in the ER, see patients with a diagnosis of HE made on therapy who have um, normal mental status. The gold standard tests are psychometric tests um, or EEG, but those are hard to get um, in real time and often not performed. The first thing we have to do is make sure that um, we rule out other causes. And so though some people will call HE a diagnosis of exclusion, I would not say it's a diagnosis of exclusion because you can have HE and drug intoxication, for example. But it is really important that we do an all around look because one, many of these things could be a trigger for HE or coexist with HE and lead to adverse consequence in our patients. In particular, patients with low platelets and elevated INR can have intracranial bleeding, hypo or hyperglycemia, drug intoxication, alteration in their oxygenation, and in particular, infection or uremia. So we should look for all of these things in our initial evaluation. And yet I see over and over again, no testing, for example, of a urine tox um, or a quick diagnostic paracentesis to rule out infection. So when we talk about HE, um, it is at the end of the day, both a alteration in level of consciousness and as well as a neurologic finding. And so if a patient is wide awake and delirious, this is not HE. And if we think about the start of hyperreflexia, loss of fine motor skills, these reflect a um, lower level of consciousness and um, a higher level of autonomic function. Asterixis is 
the next step, that really to me indicates that a patient has stage two HE. Um, and then finally, when they move to uh, coma or stupor, that's stage three and four. In between stage two and stage three, patients can be agitated, but they are agitated at a lower level of consciousness, not a higher level of consciousness. And that's where you can se separate out delirium from HE. They often at the earlier stages have slow monotonous speech, um, but movement disorders, clonus, and, and things that indicate possible increased intracranial pressure are very uncommon, except with HE due to acute uh, liver failure. So first things I think about is a clues that this may not be HE. First, HE is never focal. If a patient has new focal deficits, brain imaging, because this has to be a central ne neurologic finding. Seizures can occur with, um, with an acute liver failure with cerebral edema, but rarely with chronic liver disease. Think about drug intoxication or drug withdrawal. Um, if a patient is intoxicated or withdrawing from alcohol, that would also be a, a sign that this may not be HE, or it may be HE triggered by that, but may not need therapy long-term if we can return. Certainly same thing goes for drug illegal or legal sedating drug use. These are a typical trigger for HE, but maybe one of the situations where HE won't be an issue when those are withdrawn. Um, when we think about other situations in which HE is unlikely, that's patients with chronic liver disease who don't have signs of portal hypertension. If I see a patient with a normal platelet count, no ascites, a normal sized spleen, it seems unlikely that they will have HE. They could have a spontaneous splenorenal shunt, but it's less common. So we have new, newer guidelines that point to where um, we should uh, do our approach, but the four point approach hasn't really changed in those newer guidelines. The first is just basic care. We think about it. Um, Kevin Mullen always used to teach me that most patients will get better with just hydration and correction of electrolyte abnormalities. Seek and treat alternate causes. We talked about that, mainly brain imaging, toxicology, and looking for infection. That also leads into identifying and correcting precipitating factors withdrawal of intoxicating medications and treatment of infection, as well as correction of electrolyte abnormalities. And while we are treat, under uh, identifying and treating the precipitating factors, we begin empirical HE therapy. And if you feel the patient has over HE that is required initiation of therapy, I hope I'm gonna teach you over this period of time, the standard will be dual therapy um, with lactulose and rifaximin because the issue of getting approval for rifaximin and getting discharge rifaximin is often an issue. As part of our approach um, at New York Presbyterian, we begin the prior authorization process for rifaximin when we initiate it in the hospital. So let's look at um, this in an algorithmic form. We have a patient, they should have um, at least child's pu A, but actually once they have HE, they're gonna be child's pu B um, because HE is a decompensating event. And if you just calculate your um, child's pu score, once you get two or three points for HE, you'll always have hypoalbuminemia or something that pushes you into child's pu B. We're going to look for um, GI bleeding as well as infection, um, hypoglycemia, hypokalemia, often due to overuse of either diuretics or lactulose, alkalosis, and other metabolic um, abnormalities. Generally, I think a non-contrast CT of the brain to rule out a bleed is an okay start. I think MRI should really be regarded for people who have atypical findings or focal findings. At some point you need to look for um, uh, 
this as part of systemic collaterals. The mainly thing I look for on abdominal Doppler is portal vein thrombosis or hepatic vein thrombosis. A Doppler is usually unlikely to find a large portal systemic shunt, but may. But in patients who have no ascites and dense HE, getting either a CT with contrast or an MRI to look for a spontaneous splenorenal shunt that could be um, embolized by IR, eliminating uh, sedatives and tranquilizers, uh, fixing bleeding, infection, and electrolyte abnormalities. So how do we rule out other causes in brief? Obviously, history is important, but I think the key things are making sure that prompt tapping um, is done in the ER and getting some type of urine toxicology screen as well as alcohol testing. We've moved from getting urine ethanol glucuronide to PEF. I think that's the standard. I think the one thing to avoid is a serum ethanol level because they're generally not that good. And I talked about brain imaging. So um, correcting those underlying problems, I, I think the one thing that to think about is um, I don't worry much about excessive dietary protein. I think it's important to educate people that protein is very rarely the cause of uh, HE um, unless they go to the you know 54 ounce steak special at the local uh, Longhorn. Um, but uh, and that we should caution against. Uh, protein restriction in our patients as the catabolic state and sarcopenia provide, um, lose an alternate source of your urea cycling. GI hemorrhage should be real bleeding, um, not a guaiac positive stool in the ER with a normal hemoglobin. Um, and then we talked about uh, spontaneous shunts, obviously patients with TIPS. Um, we're going to have a debate later on in this uh, program about uh, prophylactic therapy uh, post tips. Hopefully I'll win, but um, we'll see. And then we talked about the other causes. Um, looking for uh, malignancy in addition to vascular occlusion is also quite important. I tend to start with an ultrasound, but at some point making sure you have a contrast uh, scan is probably critical. Um, as I said, ammonia testing should never, basically never be been done. This is in our, uh, our guidelines, um, and you can see several comments. Blood ammonia levels cause as much confusion in those requesting the measurements as in the patients in whom they are being uh, measured. One of my, uh, my favorite quotes from Adrian Rubin, um, and the only time I measure serum ammonia is acute liver failure, um, where an arterial ammonia greater than 200 is predictive of poor outcome. I will say one caveat is, if I have a patient who I think doesn't have HE, and I'm unable to convince the neurologist of that fact, I do measure ammonia and pray to the Lord that it will be normal to get them to take the patients uh, seriously. Once we have HE, we do need to stage it. We're gonna talk later on about covert HE, which is um, stages zero and one. These are usually subclinical. I, I would say that stage one is an area where you may in the clinic be able to make a clinical diagnosis. Oftentimes patients will give you subtle signs. I always ask about day-night reversal or the inability to do tasks as quickly as they used to, because this is a concentration area. So if they used to be able to do the New York Times crossword puzzle, and now they're having trouble with Wordle, um, you can think that's a big change because Wordle is pretty darn easy. Um, once they have asterixis, they're in stage two. Everybody should be able to recognize that stage three stupor and stage four coma those patients need to be hospitalized. So we talked about the immediate goal. So we're, the key is starting therapy and making sure that therapy will be provided um, at the time of discharge. So 
Um, the initial goal for overt HE is to try to get them back from stages two, three, and four to stages zero and one, because we cannot eliminate HE. We go from overt to try to get them to covert, which we define as sort of remission from acute HE, and then they're in chronic HE. Most of that focused on correcting precipitating factors and reduction of nitrogenous load from the gut, Generally with lactulose, though in severe states, I think a if a NG tube is in place and the patient is in stage three or four, um, go lightly lavage um, probably works uh, quicker. So what are our therapies available? We have lactulose and rifaximin. And I put a big red X through the three on the bottom, which people still like to use at times, largely because they are cheap, but they are not as good. They are not approved for HE and they have significant side effects. Neomycin, which is absorbed, do, um, has a risk of both odo and renal toxicity. You can monitor for renal toxicity, but ototoxic risk, you'll only notice when hearing is lost. Long-term metronidazole is associated with um, peripheral neuropathy, which is reversible. So our non-absorbable antibiotic of choice, and the only one in our guidelines, is rifaximin, um, which has been shown to reduce the risk of recurrence of overt HE in adult patients. And lactulose, which really works several ways to decrease nitrogenous waste products in the gut by acidifying the colon, changing gut bacteria, as well as its cathartic effect. Please don't overestimate the impact of the cathartic effect. Low doses of lactulose, um, I think in general, uh, work better than high doses. So lactulose is the mainstay, particularly of acute HE therapy. It's fermented in the colon. It lowers the colonic pH as well as its cathartic effect. However, our uh, goals are really um, to start to get to two low stools per day. Um, I'm not a big fan of the one to two hour dosing. Um, I think that less is more. Um, if you need quick therapy, to me, um, a purge is a better approach. And then using, to me, BID and most TID dosing, and I tell my patients, try to get to two loose stools. Um, soft, not liquid. Um, obviously, the side effects of lactulose are known and lead to frequent discontinuation, which leads to adverse consequence. Rifaximin um, is not approved for the treatment of acute HE, but to prevent um, uh, recurrence. And it has been shown that early initiation of uh, a rifaximin will reduce the recurrence of HE and readmissions. So this was the pivotal study published by Nathan Bass and his colleagues uh, in the New England Journal now over a decade ago, showing that a rifaximin compared to placebo, which is really combination therapy since 91% were on lactulose in both arms, reduced um, time to breakthrough by 50%. In addition to the effects on hospitalization, and we had a beautiful lecture on the cost of hospitalization preceding me, um, there is also impacts on quality of life, driving ability and driving accidents, which increases the risk to others. The caregiver burden is substantial, not just in terms of administering lactulose, but worrying about their loved one, inability for the caregiver to live, leave the house, and this can lead to substantial both direct and indirect financial burden. And um, if you don't think that this is an indication for prompt liver transplantation, one, you only have to look at the survival in patients with um, HE, which is lower than transplantation, but evidence that long-term HE may result in who an incomplete return of cognitive function post-transplant. Now, what we haven't shown is that better treatment of HE will mitigate that effect. 
I think clearly earlier transplant will mitigate that effect. And one would think on the margin that better therapy and fewer episodes of acute HE might um, mitigate the effect on post-transplant liver um, brain function, because we do want to return patients to normal cognitive function post-transplant. So the final thing is that HE not only is a, a sign of morbidity and mortality, but is the most frequent cause for readmissions. So it is the gift that keeps on giving. You can see in this uh, model, um, threefold increase in the risk of readmission. Every other complication, even HRS, had a lower adjusted risk of readmission. I wonder though for HRS, whether that's reduced because of the high mortality that um, precedes readmission. But you can see that um, of our complications of portal hypertension, HE um, has a high risk of readmission. Um, and if we look uh, where at rifaximin, this has been shown to reduce the risk of readmission. This dates back to the early days um, with retrospective data that was produced by Carol Levy and then subsequently validated multiple times. But despite um, an FDA indication and um, ample data that supports that it works, 60% of patients discharged um, from the hospital, and at least this um, study by Guy Neff, showed that they did not get um, ongoing prophylactic therapy on the date of discharge. Um, and rehospitalization um, is uh, the result of being discharged with inadequate medication. And so improved patient education, early contact and telehealth is an area where we could really expand here. Um, because it allows the caregiver to be involved in this, as well as um, referral and prior authorization. So um, my partner, Arun Jasudian, is big into checklists. Um, he loves quality improvement. Not that I don't like quality improvement, but um, I'm not general. I am I, I, a checklist uh, person. Um, do, does the patient know what HE is going to impact on them? Do they know what the signs of recurrence are before they're in a coma and a way to get in touch other than the ER? Do they have a prompt scheduled follow-up? Do they have their medications? Have we looked at the precipitating factors? If they come in on sedatives, do the family know not to give them on discharge? And if they're candidates for transplant, they should be referred. So um, both primary, um, primary care interventions can reduce this. Um, this was a this that comes from Santiago Munoz. Um, he did a, um, a study um, at discharge. He verified that the patients were still taking uh, rifaximin and lactulose. If they weren't taking rifaximin, um, you, you can uh, verify that it was used on the uh, medications. Make sure that they get refills. Oftentimes they are let sent out with two day, two week supply and no refills to encourage follow. -up. But what that really encourages is not being able to get a refill because they only got a two week supply and being readmitted at three weeks. And there are copay assistance and social workers can help getting the patients the medications they need. Oh, so I'm going to stop here and um, I went one slide too far. And um, thank you for your attention and look forward to seeing you all um, in uh, Huntington Beach uh, tomorrow. But if you're curious, the snow here is awesome. I think Bob said he can't hear us, but I hope he's gonna join us for the panel discussion uh, after this next talk. Um, the next talk is uh, going to be given by Dr. Douglas Simonetto from the Mayo Clinic. He's actually the first of his two talks this morning. He's done a lot of innovative work in uh, this area as well, particularly in digital health and uh, artificial intelligence. He's going to cover the topic of implications of antibiotic use in cirrhotics. Are we ever over or underutilizing? And after this, there'll be the 
panel discussion. So please provide your questions. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here. So brief overview of this talk. So we're gonna cover basically the prevalence of infections in patients with cirrhosis, the use of antibiotics, as well as the consequences of their use. And finally, end with some unmet needs in future directions that still need some research before they're ready for prime time. So first, bacterial infections in cirrhosis. Unfortunately, they are quite common. 30 to 50% of patients who are hospitalized with cirrhosis will have or will develop an infection in the hospital. Cirrhosis is associated with a four-fold increased risk of nosocomial infections compared to general population. And unfortunately, 25% of all deaths in cirrhosis are attributed to bacterial infections. So really, a, clearly a big problem in our population. A couple of reasons for that relate to the pathophysiology of cirrhosis and how it may affect the immune system and the gut barrier. So there is immune dysfunction associated with cirrhosis due to decreased synthesis of proteins by hepatocytes who are failing. And that leads to decreased opsonins and complement proteins that help to help fight infections. There's also impairment of copper cell function, which leads to impaired immune system and shunting of bacteria and bacterial products into the systemic circulation. In the gut, there is loss of protection from the mucosal barrier, decrease IgA production, as well as increased translocation by increasing gut permeability due to loosened gut um, tight junctions. So all these factors will lead to increased translocation of bacteria and bacterial products into the systemic circulation and consequently lead to systemic inflammation with pro-inflammatory cytokines, nitric oxide, and unfortunately may lead to tissue injury and organ failure. The most common bacterial infections, community acquired, I should say, bacterial infections in patients with cirrhosis, still are SVP, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, with a prevalence between 20 and 25%, followed by UTIs, urinary tract infections, between 12 and 30%. But pneumonias and bloodstream infections, whether it's spontaneous or catheter associated, are still are also quite common. Now, I'm going to touch on the three recommendations for antibiotic prophylaxis. So this is what where they should be used, where they have been shown to improve outcomes in patients with cirrhosis. The first one is a primary indication, and this is for patients with low acidic fluid protein, less than 1.5 grams per deciliter when present and associated with impaired renal function or liver failure as defined here. And the theory there is that Again, low acidic fluid protein means less opsonins, less complement proteins, and thus higher risk of bacterial products to proliferate in the acidic fluid and lead to SPP. So this is an old study now, and you can see it was a small randomized trial, but it was really the basis for this recommendation where they compared norfloxacin with placebo. And you can see that the risk of SPP at one year was over 60% in patients with low acidic fluid protein, and that risk was decreased to less than 10% with the use of norfloxacin. So a big, big difference there in the reason for this recommendation. In the same study, they found that using norfloxacin was associated with a lower risk of hepatorenal syndrome and potentially a lower risk of mortality, so improved survival as well at one year. Another indication for primary prophylaxis is in the setting of upper GI bleeding, and that means all upper GI bleeding, not just variceal bleeding. We kind of have a reflex to start ceftriaxone in patients with variceal bleeding, but we may forget in patients that have other causes of GI bleeding. Also important to note that recommendation here is for all patients with cirrhosis, not just those that have ascites, because these patients are also increased risk of infections, and that's not just SVP but also spontaneous bacteremia and UTIs. So don't rely on the presence of ascites to decide whether to give antibiotic prophylaxis. All cirrhotic patients with an upper GI bleeding should give, be given prophylaxis for seven days. And the risk of infections is quite high, ranging from nearly 40% to 65%, depending on which study you look at. And unfortunately, as we know, bacterial infections are associated with higher mortality, as well as a higher risk of re-bleeding, which can be significantly reduced with the use of prophylactic antibiotics. 
And then finally, the other indication for prophylaxis is secondary prophylaxis. Patients that have a history of SPP at a really quite high rate of risk for recurrence within six months and 50% within two years, over two thirds of, third of patients will develop recurrent SPP. Now, their risk can be reduced with the use of prophylaxis as well. And this is an area where we can all do a bit better, particularly patients who are hospitalized with SPP to initiate or plan to initiate signal prophylaxis after discharge and not wait for them to be seen by their primary hepatologist or primary uh, care provider, which may be delayed. And you don't want to have a gap in there due to the high risk of recurrent SPP. So this table summarizes the three indications for antibiotic prophylaxis in patients with cirrhosis. As I mentioned, the gastrointestinal bleeding, whether or not upper GI bleeding, whether or not ascites is present. Ceftriaxone is the recommended drug of choice for patients that have complications, two or more complications of cirrhosis. So if they have ascites, encephalopathy, jaundice, or malnutrition. If they don't have those complications, then oral quinolones should be sufficient and enough. That is only for seven days, though. No need to do long-term prophylaxis here, unless they have low acidic flow protein and other complications as listed. And note that for the two lower medications here that I have mentioned, that prophylaxis is until death or liver transplantation. So we're talking about long-term use of antibiotics here. And unfortunately, there is a consequence to overuse of antibiotics and that is the development of multidrug resistant organisms. The overall prevalence of MDROs worldwide is about 30%. That's quite high. And in countries such as India, that's over 70%. And I was just in India recently and I learned that you can actually buy antibiotics there without prescriptions. And that's probably one of the reasons why there is such a high rate of MDROs there. In the US, we're still in the green zone with 16% prevalence of MDRs. But that rate is increasing, and we need to be paying attention to that because it is estimated that by 2050, about 10 million deaths will be attributed to multidrug resistant organisms. And that's up from currently 700,000. So, really, a big jump there if we fail to address this problem. Another consequence of antibiotic use is fungal infection. So, this is a study done by the next cell group, which is a North American consortium of patients with decompensated cirrhosis in acute and chronic liver failure admitted to the hospital. And they found that overall prevalence of infections was high, about 40%. But more important, that almost 13% of all infections were caused by fungal organisms. All fungal infections were found to be hospital acquired or nosocomial and were associated with ICU admission, presence of diabetes, prior use of antibiotics, and admissions with bacterial infections, renal failure, and prolonged hospital stay. And as one would expect, fungal infections do lead to worse outcomes with 40% rate of organ failures, 60% ICU admissions, and over 30% 30-day mortality. So, that leads to emphasizes the need for appropriate management and use of antibiotic therapy in bacterial infections. And so it's important to recognize the type and the source of infection because they'll help you use the appropriate antibiotics and for the appropriate duration. So one is to really distinguish community acquired, healthcare associated, which means patients that were exposed to the healthcare system in the prior three to six months and nosocomial hospital acquired, which are infections acquired in the hospital after 48 hours from admission. And you see that the prevalence of different infections differs. Community acquired healthcare associated, fairly similar. As I mentioned before, the two most common infections are SPP and UTIs. But if you look at hospital acquired nosocomial infections, much higher rate of UTIs, probably related to the use of urinary catheters in the hospital, as well as clostridioides difficile infections. And I already mentioned the higher risk of fungal infections, which are all nosocomial. So this is a busy table, but it's just for your reference on the major and potential risk factors for the development of MDROs as, as well as fungal infections. And I'll just highlight here that long-term norfloxacin or quinolone use is a potential risk factor. And that's because of conflicting data suggesting that maybe it does not increase the risk of MDROs, 
Although a more recent study at the VA showed that it might actually increase the risk of developing multidrug resistant organisms. How can we prevent nosocomial infections in multidrug resistant organisms? Well, first, infection control policies. And that should be implemented universally in the hospital, appropriate isolation of patients who are colonized or infectant with MDROs, proper hand hygiene, environmental cleaning, barrier precautions with gowns and gloves when indicated, epidemiological surveillance, so the use of rectal and nasal swabs to detect colonizers of multidrug resistant organisms, early de-escalation policies, so really important to ensure that patients don't stay on broad spectrum antibiotics for longer than needed. So whenever possible, follow susceptibility and also clinical response to escalate early, otherwise that will lead to selective resistance. Shorter antibiotic duration is often equal or even better than longer duration in terms of outcomes. So five to seven days for many indications and infections is sufficient and better than seven to, oh, excuse me, 10 to 14 days. So whenever possible, aim and target the shorter duration and that will be equally effective. And then for hospitalized patients, where as I mentioned before, nosocomial infections are often associated with the use of urinary catheters, central lines and mechanical ventilation. So minimizing those interventions whenever possible it will also be helpful in reducing the risk of nosocomial infections and development of MDROs. So a couple of unmet needs. So one is the issue with severe alcohol-associated hepatitis. Unfortunately, these patients are at really high risk of bacterial infections, ranging from 30% as high as 84%, recently reported by Sanchez and colleagues in hepatology. So really quite high rate of infections within 90 days of presentation. And we know that prednisolone, which is often used, does increase their risk. However, one may wonder whether antibiotic prophylaxis here will be indicated. And this is a randomized controlled trial that was presented at the International Liver Conference in 2021, it has not been published yet as far as I know, but they compared prednisolone plus placebo with prednisolone plus amoxicillin clavulonic acid or augmenting. And it found no difference at two month or 60 day survival. So despite these patients have a pretty high rate of infections and sepsis, which we know lead to worse outcomes, giving antibiotics for this population do not necessarily improve outcome. Another unanswered question on med need is the role of rifaximine in patients with a prophylaxis. So in rifaximine, as already discussed by Dr. Brown, is a non-absorbable antibiotic, has been shown to lead to less or lower rate of antibiotic resistance or multidrug resistant organisms compared to quinolones, for example. However, the role of rifaximine for prophylaxis of SPP or bacterial infections has not been clearly shown. There's conflicting data some potential signal, but mostly coming from retrospective single center studies or a couple open label single, single center trials suggesting that rifaximine may be superior even to norfloxacin to prevent SBP recurrence, especially. And rifaximine has been shown in in vitro data in animal studies to decrease bacterial translocation, decrease the presence of lipopolysaccharide in the portal circulation, decrease systemic inflammation as well. And two other areas that need further research that are promising are the use of phage therapy, as well as fecal microbiota transplantation. But again, those are not ready for prime time. More research is needed and more human studies specifically are needed. So this is my last slide, just summarizing what we discussed. The epidemiology and bacteriology of infections are changing radically. I had mentioned this, but nosocomial infections in particular are more likely to be caused by gram-positive organisms, including SBP when acquired in the hospital, is more likely to be caused by a gram-positive organism than a gram-negative one. So keeping that in mind will also help and also tailoring antibiotics, the escalating, using for shorter duration will all help to prevent the burden of increasing multidrug-resistant organisms. Strategies that reduce the burden, as I mentioned, are needed and may improve outcomes. Thank you.
Is Dr. Brown going to be able to participate? Do we know? I hope so. Yes. So while we're waiting for some of the questions to be, oh. So first Sammy. of all, great discussion this morning. Um, I have a question for Muhammad. Why are healthcare dollars higher for people with alcohol liver disease than non-alcohol liver disease with liver complications? Can you hear me? Uh, I think that's a great question and actually one that I'm looking into, uh, but I think severity of illness has to play a big role in that. Uh, also, uh, underlining comorbidities as well. So patients with, with alcoholic-related cirrhosis might suffer from other diseases. And we, we, we saw some very interesting uh, numbers about infections and, and, and so on. So the, the answer is I, we don't really know, but, but it's probably related to the underlining causes of, of diseases and comorbidities and also severity of illness. So it's actually a question that I'm trying to work on. But it's really hard. The quality of data is not very good for alcoholic cirrhosis, uh, especially about assessing the the long life history of alcoholic excessive use and so on. So this is something area we I think we need to do a better job collecting data on. Dr. Reddy? Yeah, uh, Doug, there's a very nice talk and this is a topic that's very near and dear to me, as you know. So a couple of things. I mean, we seem like we're going the wrong way in terms of infection and cirrhosis. So uh, we talked. You talked about the mechanisms, right? There is um, there's a bacteria in the gut. There's an impaired immune system, and there's increased bacterial translocation. So we seem like we are focusing on changing the gut microbiota. But do you know of any work that is being done in trying to decrease bacterial translocation? Uh, enhance uh, gut immunity. Uh, um, uh, so, so that's one question. Second thing is, our conventional way of getting cultures, it takes about two, three days. And I know there are some efforts to try and uh, improve on that uh, through rapid mechanisms, mass spectroscopy and all. Uh, any uh, insight uh, at your institution or otherwise in trying to get uh, culture results faster so that we don't empirically treat them with antibiotics and you know go the wrong way in terms of multidrug resistant organisms? Thank you. That's, can you hear me? Thank you. So that, that was a great question. So related to your first question, I think you're right. I think the focus has been mainly on modulated microbiome and dysbiosis that's present in cirrhosis. That will that is the impact of microbiota on gut translocation as well and gut permeability. So it's expected that they will help be able to modulate that with fecal microbiota transplant or phage therapy. But as far as I'm aware, there's nothing really directed to the gut um, that I'm aware of, at least at the moment. And related to your second question, which was. Oh, right. Yes. So rapid detection of infection. So yeah, there's a lot of study being done in that space using um, PCR modalities, you know, metagenomics and, and other modalities that can be used at with same day results. However, they might be oversensitive. They didn't, as you know, that that is bacterial product translocation that does not necessarily mean an infection. So detecting those, does that necessarily indicate the use of antibiotics or not? So I think we need to learn more about those results, what they mean. Uh, whether it's just a bacterial product that your immune system is taking care of, or that is truly an infection that may benefit from antibiotic therapy. I think we don't know. We're not quite there yet. I think there are, is literature about rifaximin closing tight junctions and, and decreasing translocation that way. The other way? I'll take the occasion to ask uh, Dr. Brown, um, can you comment on, you know, we see patients in clinic who don't have any apparent um, liver disease, but they're sent over for an elevated ammonia. How do you handle those? And what do you think uh, the causes are usually? Um, that's a great question. And it does happen. Um, I, I think that the first thing is make sure you exclude occult liver disease. So 
I, I generally start with a fiber scan. If they have normal liver stiffness and normal anatomy, um, you're probably good. Part of it is just how it's collected. Venous ammonia that's not processed promptly will rise. Obviously, renal dysfunction, excessive exercise, a lot of things can increase ammonia. But it, it is a problem once once you have that level. And so they end up getting, I think, over tested. But I would say I start with, you know, a basic screen for liver disease, a fiber scan, and, and I think some type of vascular imaging to rule out a spontaneous shunt, though one would think that a spontaneous shunt in the absence of high resistance in the um, tract won't be a problem. And then I think the answer is, stop the therapy for the elevated ammonia, um, which they're often come to me on, and then monitor their mental status after that fact, which usually remains normal. And then if you can get them to stop measuring ammonia. We've seen this a lot in chemotherapy patients uh, interfering with their urea cycle. Any, any uh, particular drugs that you can think of or comments on that? Um, I think there are a lot of drugs that um, uh, interfere with urea cycle. And there are a lot of things that lead to increased catabolism. You know, uh, patients on chemotherapy have ver have higher cell turnover and increased urea production and would be expected to have an elevated ammonia. Um, uh, you know, I, I, if you really need to, you could probably check an arterial ammonia and you'd find it's near normal. Mohammed, um, you know, I, we commented in the beginning of your talk about 600,000 people. And do you have a sense of what the number truly might be? Uh, definitively, no, but it's probably double that. So if we think about death related to chronic liver diseases, excluding cancer, uh, there's about 56,000. So it's about 1.8% of all death. Uh, globally, there's 2 million deaths due to chronic liver disease, half of which is cirrhosis. So if we only think about the same number, whether it's close enough or not, so half of 1.6 is 0.8%. So, and that's cirrhosis by itself. So that, that tells us that the prevalence is probably close to, close to 1% or a little bit higher than 1% actually um, of the whole population which gives you much, much higher than 600,000. And also that exclude patients who progress to liver diseases such as primary liver cancer and so on. So it, it, the numbers are telling us there is an increased trend and that what says is the prevalence is increasing, that the, the risk is not probably changing because the ideology remains the same, right? So if the prevalence is increasing, that means people are living longer with it due to improved care and so on, which means the burden is increasing, right? Uh, because the, the disease duration is longer. So, so the number is probably much higher. The problem is we don't collect data on cirrhosis at the national level. We collect data on chronic liver diseases, which is a much more dynamic uh, with, with NAFLD and, all, and so on. And then I've shown the numbers, it's close to 14%, the prevalence. So I'm, I'm very convinced by the number of this evidence. We're working on this problem using multiple uh, big health claims data and try to cross-reference that with, with national samples to actually get an estimate or a very close estimate to actual true prevalence of disease. Doug, do you have any data maybe from the Mayo Clinic about the effect of COVID on some of the translocation, SBP rates, or anything like that? Um question. I'm not familiar with the data directly related to that. So the next health group has published some data um, on the impact of COVID in patients with chronic liver disease, showing that patients do have worse outcomes overall. I don't know whether they had shown increased rate of SVP necessarily with that translocation, and we don't have any work done in that space yet. It seemed to me that we saw less multi-drug resistant organisms during COVID because people actually took precautions more seriously. That was just my anecdotal observation. Is there any data on that? Potentially, yes. There is potentially some data from uh, alcohol-associated hepatitis uh, consortium, LCAPNAT, uh, potentially showing the signal the same. 
that patients with LCAP maybe had last infections during COVID potentially due to, again, increased precautions. But it has not been published yet. Bob Gish. Yeah, great morning. Thank you very much. And I wanted to ask two quick questions. One is there's a blood test called the carious liquid biopsy will detect over a thousand infectious diseases in one blood sample, either deep-seated infections or blood infections. Have you heard of the carious test? Carious test? K-A-R-I-U-S. I have not. I just sent it to you, Vinod. If you want to send it to the speakers, that would be good. It'd be yeah. interesting. Last Thank question, you. super short. Norfloxacin is not available, right? right? I don't know if it's available anywhere in the world. <laughs> Why is it still on these lists? I haven't written a prescription in 20 years. <laughs> I'm not question. sure there's an answer. Yes. <laughs> One more question. Yeah. But I think it's a shame that it's not available. Um, you know, I think it's led to overuse of Cipro and Leviquin which is overkill um, for SPP prophylaxis. Um, it's one of those things where they didn't make enough money. And so um, it's disappeared. I, I, for a change, I'm delighted that norfloxacin is not available. I, I think uh, potential for harm there is significant. So after Piano's paper and the paper from a couple of weeks ago showing that when you expose a cirrhotic to quinolones, you get rapid and uh, widespread MDR development in that setting. I can get why someone needs secondary SPP prophylaxis. I don't think we need to debate that. But is it really a good idea to give someone who has a total protein less than one who's never had SPP, SPP prophylaxis? Are we really doing a child pub patient a good by intervening that way? I, 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 I fail to see how that would be a true statement. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And I think, as I mentioned before, up until recently, as alluded to two recent studies, we did not know for a fact that nafloxacin increased the risk of MDROs. Um, the study that I showed where the benefit was with nafloxacin for low acidic fluid protein is quite old. It's a small one of my trial with a little over 30 patients in each arm, and it has not been for the study. We, I mean, we had answered that question. We felt that the question was answered, and then that became a recommendation it has been propagated since. I think with this new data concerning the, the development of MDROs and the rising in the prevalence of MDROs should raise that question. And we need more studies then to answer whether there's truly a benefit there or not. There are no more questions. Oh, there's one more. Yes. Uh, Bob, this is a question for you. Uh, patient with cirrhosis, no history of encephalopathy who comes in with a UTI and is encephalopathic at the time you treat the UTI. Uh, and she gets better. Uh, is she on rifaximin for life? Uh, that's a great question. A and to me, the answer is probably yes. Um, because I think the likelihood that with treatment of the UTI, they revert to really stage zero and not stage one is very small. Um, so if you want to stop therapy, I think you have to commit yourself to doing better testing than just holding up their hands and seeing if they flap. Um, if you're Jazz Bajaj and you're going to do your stroop and do all those things, I think you could do a cautious removal and close follow-up. But for most of us in clinical practice, um, uh, it, it's easier to continue given the high likelihood that one, there'll be another precipitant, or two, that even when you stop therapy, they're going to have significant covert AG that's going to adversely affect their quality of life. Well, I thank uh, the speakers for this session and for your questions. We'll go on to the next session. Dr. Persopoulos. Good morning, everybody. I believe this was an excellent session, judging from the number of questions, especially professors asking professors. And switching gears now, I would like to ask Dr. Mitchell to join us. Dr. Mitchell is a professor at UT Southwestern, and he is the vice chair of clinical affairs, but he's very well known for his research on alcohol-associated liver disease. He will be discussing trends in alcohol use and impact on chronic liver disease. Dr. Mitchell. Right. 
thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to talk. I've found this to be a great meeting over the last few years, and it's it's a pleasure to be here with you today. What I'm going to try to do is first just describe what's going on in the United States and and um, parts, uh, in your communities with regard to alcohol consumption, and then talk a little bit more in detail about how that consumption of alcohol may be impacting the health of patients with liver disease. So the first thing that I want to do is just sort of describe for you what's happened here in the United States with regard to alcohol consumption over the last uh, 70 or 80 years. And if we go all the way back to when prohibition ended and look at the trend in consumption, as you can see on the left panel, you can see that there was a gradual increase or there was an abrupt increase and then a more gradual increase until uh, the, the uh, 1960s and 70s. And if you look at what happened in the 1960s and 70s, the baby boomers turned 18. And when people turn 18, they begin to drink alcohol. And there was a big spike in alcohol consumption, which is probably related to the macro demographics of what happened in terms of the population. And you can see on the right-hand panel that initially that consumption was in the form of beer, but over the last few years, beer consumption has actually declined while spirits consumption has actually increased. And in 1980, about 50% of consumption was beer, but nowadays uh, it's far less. And that may also have some impact in terms of the overall consumption. Now, this is um, just to show you, if you look state by state, what's happening, and this is measured based on alcohol sales. And I think it's no surprise that Utah has relatively lower sales of alcohol than other parts of the country. I did find it a little surprising to see Oklahoma listed here. And I say that because every time we have the Red River rivalry in Dallas, where the fans from Oklahoma come down to play the University of Texas, I can't imagine that it's only the drinkers who come on that trip. But there are certainly plenty of them who do make that uh, pilgrimage each year. Interestingly to me, New Hampshire actually had the highest per capita sales of alcohol. Now, sometimes that may be because they have lower taxes and everybody from Massachusetts is going to New Hampshire to buy their alcohol. But I think it's an interesting way to look at this. The problem when you look at alcohol consumption is if you stick just with sales, you're probably um, underestimate or you're overestimating uh, consumption in some ways. And, and, and when you look at individual self-reports, you're probably underestimating consumption. And some of that has to do with the fact that there's confusion among participants in surveys about what constitutes a standard drink. There's a recall and social desirability factor that may influence or bias the reporting. And there's also some selection bias in terms of eliminating or skipping populations that may have heavy consumption, such as uh, homeless uh, people. Now, because of that, both the WHO and the Global Burden of Disease groups adjust survey data to increase that data up to 80% of what the reported per capita sales are. The other myth that I want to sort of dispel is, and this is particularly true for every one of us that trained in a hospital where there was an underrepresented population, safety net hospitals in particular, where you get the misimpression that it's all the underrepresented minorities in our population that are really responsible for all the alcohol associated uh, diseases. But in reality, it's actually white men who are the most frequent drinkers within the population. Second, uh, the Latino men, and the lowest consumption is actually in black women and Latina women. Those are, those are some things that I think a lot of us find surprising, particularly as we start looking at our own uh, practices where, again, some of these populations may be overrepresented just because of where we practice. So um, as we look more into this and say, well, what constitutes um, heavy consumption, what constitutes light consumption, et cetera, and how many people uh, fall into these categories. I think it's interesting to note 
that about a third of people in the United States don't drink or didn't drink within the past year. Now, there may be a few people in that category who are abstaining because of health reasons or having been told to do so, but there's a very high percentage, uh, if you think about it, that are falling into this category. On the other hand, there's a lot of people who are very occasional drinkers, meaning maybe more than once a month, but less than three drinks a week. And that's really a large percentage of the population. So when you get down to those people who are drinking more than four drinks a week, um, it's actually only about 25% of the population. And so it's that percentage of the population that we want to look more carefully at. Now, heavy drinking defined here uh, in this survey as more than 14 drinks a week for men and more than seven drinks a week for women uh, occurs in a small percentage. That's six and a half percent of, of white Americans, almost three percent of non-Hispanic uh, black Americans, and only uh, 2.6 percent of Hispanics. So that's a relatively small number. And I want you to remember that because when we see patients who, are, who we are classifying as alcohol-related liver disease or alcohol-associated liver disease, uh, we need to keep that in mind. Now, I think everybody in this room knows that the COVID pandemic was more than just a viral infection. There were a lot of things that happened during that pandemic. And one of the things in particular that happened uh, very clearly was an increase in per capita sales of alcohol, particularly in the first year of the COVID epidemic, you can see that there was a 15% increase in alcohol sales by the summer of 2020. And those increases persisted all the way through uh, until you know, 2021. And I'm sure that almost everyone in this room had the experience of noting that there were a lot more admissions to your hospitals for patients with alcohol-associated problems than you had been experiencing or seen in the 2017 to 2019 timeframe. And that's shown very clearly in this next slide uh, where we look at alcohol-related deaths. And between 2019 and 2020, alcohol-related deaths increased 37% in, in subjects who were 25 to 34 years of age and 40% in those who were 35 to 44 years of age. So those are huge increases in the death rates in a very short period of time in these younger uh, populations. Deaths from alcohol-associated liver disease actually increased 22% during this period of time. And that begins to make us think more about the effects of recent consumption on death from alcohol-associated liver disease and not so much about how many years you had to drink to get to that point. So I want you to keep those things in mind as we start to look at some of the other data that I'm going to share with you. Now, this was a very nice meta-analysis that looked at what is the real relationship between consumption of alcohol and development of, of cirrhosis. And the first thing that you can see here is that the curve is going up much faster for women than it is for men. And that's something that we need to, to always keep in mind. Women are more susceptible to alcohol-associated liver injury than are men. The next thing that I want to show you is where the AASLD puts the upper limit of consumption to define and separate non-alcohol-associated fatty liver disease from alcohol-associated liver disease. And it's not very hard to see when you look at it from this perspective that there's an increase in the risk of cirrhosis that is taking place with consumption of alcohol below those levels. And these levels for men are three drinks uh, a day or 21 drinks a week. And that's actually a fairly high consumption of alcohol and I'm not sure that that's really where we want to put this if we are trying to truly separate non-alcohol-associated disease from alcohol-associated disease. So let's look at that a little bit more carefully, particularly for women. And th this slide, I think, was a very nice study that looked in detail at the consumption of alcohol in a large number of women in the United Kingdom. <clears throat> 
And the first thing that you see is that even if the weekly consumption of alcohol is similar, if you're drinking on a daily basis, the risk of liver disease is higher. Likewise, even with similar levels of consumption, if you're drinking outside of meals, the risk of liver disease is higher. Now, I'm not sure why that is. It may have something to do with how alcohol is absorbed and what you know the rate of absorption and how that's affecting the liver. I don't think we really have an explanation for this, but it's a very interesting phenomenon. And these patterns of consumption are probably more important than we've given um, uh, attention to in the past. The next thing that I wanna do is mention the fact that hazardous or harmful drinking is a lot more frequent in younger individuals than in older individuals. And if you look at the NHANES data, it's the people under the age of 35 that are drinking at a hazardous rate. And you can see from this slide also that the percentage of patients hospitalized for alcohol-associated liver disease and alcohol-associated hepatitis increased significantly over a 10-year period from 2006 to 2016. So our patients really are getting younger, and we are seeing more patients in their 20s and 30s with advanced liver disease than we did in the past. Now, one of the reasons for that may have to do with genetics, and I put this slide up to show one of the first large studies that was done using um, genome-wide association uh, to look for risk factors, not for alcohol-associated disease, but for non-alcohol-associated fatty liver disease. And this was from my colleagues, Helen Hobbs and Jonathan Cohen at UT Southwestern. And they identified PNPLA3 as being an important um, uh, 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 polymorphism that was associated with non-alcohol-associated fatty liver disease. We looked at this a little bit further in the NHANES population and found that um, those patients who had the wild type uh, genotype, when they increased their alcohol consumption, really didn't show much of an increase in the risk of uh, fatty liver. However, if you were homozygous for the mutation, your risk of fatty liver disease increased significantly. And there's also a number of studies that have shown PNPLA3 to be associated with alcohol-associated cirrhosis. And you can see on the right-hand panel, the cirrhosis develops at an earlier stage and more frequently in patients who are uh, homozygous for the mutation. You can take this further and look for other genes that are associated with fatty liver and with cirrhosis and elevations in ALT. And again, you find PNPLA3, but you also find TM6SF2, uh, the alpha-1 antitrypsin gene, the uh, hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase uh, beta-13. You know, uh, um, and there's a lot of genes now that have been identified, and we can put those together and come up with uh, what's known as a polygenic risk score. And with this polygenic risk score, you can see uh, that there's increases in the hazard ratios, both for those people who are in the top uh, 20% having the abnormal or the risk-associated um, uh, polymorphism. And then you can also see increases uh, with the intermediate risk uh, in the same uh, population. So polygenic risk scores have been used in a lot of other disorders like diabetes and cardi cardiovascular disease, and I think are giving us clues about what is going on here. And there really is a true uh, interaction between genes and, um, and the environmental uh, factors. I'm sorry that uh, the slide looks like it's, it's sort of gotten out of, uh, um, you know, the, the way it was formatted. But anyway, um, what you can uh, hopefully see on here is that the number of uh, drinks per week, if as you increase the number of drinks per week, you also significantly increase the risk of developing cirrhosis uh, if you have these abnormal genes. And if you take the top 1%, you can see that if you're drinking more than 21 drinks per week, that your increase, uh, your chances of developing cirrhosis are 48% over the course of your lifetime. 
But even below that, you can see increased risk at um, 14 to 21 drinks a week of 20%. Now, if you look at the right-hand panel, you also see increases based on increases in BMI. And the BMI increases um, uh, have also been shown before with just P and PLA3, but this polygenic risk score makes it even more prominent. And so with these, you can see that both alcohol consumption and obesity are contributing to the development of liver disease. Now, this slide's a little bit more complicated to look at, but in the first line, you will see patients who don't have diabetes who have the high risk score greater than 0.7 or the low risk score of zero. And the odds ratio is increased uh, for these uh, genes. But if you add diabetes to the uh, equation, you can see that that risk goes up. And if you take patients who don't have diabetes and don't have the genes, then compare them to people with the genes and with diabetes, you can see that the odds ratios are quite high, 14, 15, 17. Those are higher than the risks of lifetime smoking and lung cancer, way higher, in fact. So if you are at risk because of your genes and you have diabetes, you're definitely at risk for developing cirrhosis. And this, in this case, it was alcohol-associated cirrhosis. Now, why is that? Well, we can look at this study, and it gives us some clues. If you look at the baseline risk and add to that the metabolic syndrome, you can see an increase in risk. You can also see an increase in the risk with uh, weekly binge drinking. And if you put those things together, you can see not only is there an additive um, increase, but there's also a synergistic increase and an additional increase that comes from having both uh, metabolic syndrome and um, drinking on a regular basis. Now, Dr. Yanasi and his colleagues published this very nice study a few years ago uh, showing that those people um, with fatty liver disease in the NHANES study, if you followed them over a long period of time, what you could see is that only in those who are excessive drinkers did you see an increase in the rate of death. And so no alcohol versus minimal alcohol or moderate alcohol consumption, there was no change. But in this study, the excessive drinking was defined as greater than three drinks per day. Now, if you looked at that population in a little more detail, those excessive drinkers, what you find is that the metabolic syndrome itself increases your risk a little bit. Excessive alcohol without the metabolic syndrome didn't increase the risk as much. But when you put those two things together, that's where you're really seeing the risk. So remember now, when you see all of your patients with non what you're calling non alcohol associated fatty liver disease who have metabolic syndrome, have diabetes, it's really important to start asking them in detail about how much they're drinking because that's going to be one of the major factors that determines their long-term prognosis. And that's also seen here in this slide um, to where we're looking at the impact of alcohol use on veterans uh, with cirrhosis. And if you separate those uh, veterans who've had alcohol-associated uh, liver disease from those with hepatitis C and with, hepatitis, uh, with non-alcohol-associated fatty liver disease, in the yellow, you see the heaviest drinking uh, populations as defined by Audit C. Now, I'm not particularly fond of Audit C, although it is important in that it gives you a little bit of information about quantity and frequency of alcohol consumption. But the problem is your Audit C becomes, quote, positive um, when you're uh, drinking only uh, seven drinks a week or more. But when you're drinking seven drinks a week or more and you look at the what that does to your adjusted hazard ratios, it definitely increases the mortality uh, for all of these uh, groups. And it also increases the risk of decompensation. And those are the things that we need to be concerned about once somebody has liver disease. And you often get the question from your patients, Doc, is it okay for me to drink? And if so, how much can I drink? And those are questions that we have to answer on a daily basis. So when you look at alcohol-associated liver disease and recovery 
and long-term survivals. If you look at patients with compensated disease over a long period of time, those people who are abstinent definitely do better than those people uh, who are not abstinent. And again, when you look at the decompensated population, it's even more striking to see how ongoing alcohol consumption influences the um, mortality associated with alcohol-related uh, disease. So what I've tried to do in summary is to show you that approximately 50% of people in the United States are drinking alcohol on a monthly basis. And if we define heavy drinking as more than 21 drinks a week for men and 14 drinks a week for women, that's a relatively small percentage, but it's clearly harmful with regard to liver-related outcomes. The risk of developing significant liver disease in heavy drinkers is much higher in those with genetic polymorphisms and or diabetes or the metabolic syndrome. So now in the future, I think we will be getting into this era of precision medicine where eventually we will be able to look at these polymorphisms and ass assign a genetic risk score and give more precise uh, information to our patients. But the combination of heavy drinking and diabetes certainly is going to increase the risk of developing cirrhosis and the risk of mortality related to this. So once cirrhosis is present, any ongoing alcohol use is hazardous and clearly increases the risk of decompensation. So what we all need to do is reduce the heavy drinking and treat the alcohol use disorder in our patients with cirrhosis from any cause, because that's essential to preventing long-term complications, including decompensation and death. Thank you. This was an outstanding lecture. I think that we need to get a clicker and click click after every drink we get. And uh, having said that, I would like to ask Dr. Hanny Wydey to join us. He is a professor of medicine in Mayo Clinic, Jacksonville. He is a nephrologist and a transplant nephrologist. And we will hear from the horse's mouth what renal complications in patients with liver disease is. Hanny. Let's keep him in here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, among a group of hepatologists. I'm the only nephrologist here, I think. So uh, I would like to start with a case, which I just actually saw last month. That's a 62-year-old gentleman who, um, African-American, coming for liver transplant evaluation. Um, just to follow on the previous talk, he has a history of cirrhosis due to alcohol use, and he has been having diuretic responsive ascites, taking two diuretics, has history of hepatic encephalopathy and bleeding varices. No history of diabetes or hypertension, but he never went to a doctor till one and a half years ago when he was diagnosed with his liver disease. Baseline lab we did on him as part of the transplant evaluation. He has some form of kidney injury. I mean, creatinine is 1.4, 1.6. Um, we do always 24 hour urine collection. And his, based on the collection, his creatinine clearance was 33 a month per minute, but he did not really complete it. He had 160 milligram protein in the urine. And on urine analysis, it was totally bland. On the renal ultrasound, everything looked fine. So on follow-up labs, a couple of weeks later, he was found to have a creatinine of 2.8. Uh, the liver team, as outpatient, stopped his diuretics. But a week afterwards, his creatinine is 3.6. So as they admitted him to the hospital, uh, on presentation, he had what seems to be a normal blood pressure. Uh, he had deep jaundice, his bilirubin. Um, uh, it was 22, but I learned from the hepatologist, don't look at that, look at the directed bilirubin, which was 18. He had ascites, but not tense, he had lower extremity edema, and they consulted us looking for what's happening. Is it acute kidney injury, acute kidney injury on chronic kidney disease? What else? You figure it out. So uh, as the objectives of this talk is to go over the epidemiology, mainly of acute kidney injury, and in, in the current era we're living in, 
And the other talk uh, aim is to differentiate between the different causes and how I, at least as a nephrologist, uh, look at it. And um, what's new in the chronic kidney disease as a complication um, that concomitantly being diagnosed more commonly in cirrhotic patients. We are all familiar with this study because this study has been almost like 25 years ago published. So it has been heavily cited and it looks at more than 1500 hospitalized patients with cirrhosis and the risk of kidney disease. And clearly it shows that uh, the risk of chronic kidney disease at that time, 25 years ago was less than 1%. And kidney injury or acute kidney injury happens in 20% 20, 20 of these patients. The majority of the cases will be related to, oops, the majority of the cases will be really related to pre-renal uh, physiology or pre-renal failure, mainly because of volume depletion. But a third of the cases will be related to ATN, and 10% roughly was related to hepaturenal syndrome. Since this study has been published, multiple different studies looked at the prevalence and the different causes of acute kidney injury in cirrhotic patients, and I'm citing at least six studies here, including almost 6,000 patients. And as you can see, the prevalence of acute kidney injury varied widely. And the most important part, which is the risk, the cause of kidney injury also varied widely. Some studies saying that hepaturenal syndrome is 18% of the cases. Others says hepaturenal syndrome is 43% of the cases. And that's partially because of the definition of acute kidney injury was not standardized in this patient. And everyone looked at it uh, quite differently. But we live in a different era and we are lucky now because we have a standard definition of acute kidney injury that we can utilize and use it to build upon it some studies that are meaningful to tell us what is exactly happening as far as the causes and mortality risk. So the old definition used the creatinine of 1.5, but luckily now we use uh, the akin criteria, which is what we use for the general population. And creatinine has to go up by at least 0.3 or one and a half times to diagnose stage one. And stage two is doubling of the creatinine and stage three, three times the creatinine baseline or requiring dialysis. Further down the road, stage one was even further divided to stage 1A and stage 1B based on, the again, the creatinine of 1.5. And the reason is the outcome in patients with stage 1A is a little bit different, is much better than patient with stage 1B. And hepaturenal syndrome definition, as you're all familiar, has been updated as well. It used to be called hepaturenal syndrome type 1, and you have to have a creatinine above 2.5. Now it's called hepaturenal syndrome AKI, and does not have to have a cutoff value, but you have to diagnose AKI based on the previous slide and wait two days volume expand and rule out other causes and make sure that the ascites is there. So we uh, are a group of nephrologists and hepatologists that we meet on a monthly basis and we have a harmony study group. Um, with, so we decided to look at updated information here. So we did a collaborative study. you looking at 10, um, the biggest 10 centers as far as liver transplant is concerned in the US. And we looked um, at the risk of acute kidney injury in the modern era. So we looked at all consecutive patients who has been hospitalized in these 10 centers in one year, 2019. And we looked at each individual case retrospectively. Of course, every, of course everybody has 2020 hindsight, but uh, that helped us by retrospect retrospective short review look at what caused the uh, acute kidney injury, and we used the uh, um, updated definitions from 2015. A second nephrologist or hepatologist looked at the first uh, diagnosis and made sure it, they both agreed. And if they both did not agree, a third person came and educated this uh, uh, diagnosis. So using this model, we identified in the stent centers uh, more than 2,000 patients with acute kidney injury. And not surprisingly, the prerenal azotemia or prenal AKI was 
the main cause of kidney injury in these patients, followed by ATN and um, hepatorenal syndrome only consisted 12% of the cases. I just want to point out here an important fact that could be easily missed, that despite three people looking at these uh, charts, around 150 patients or 7% of the population, nobody could able to determine what caused their kidney injury. And that tells you that many times it's very difficult task. And even looking at it retrospectively, retrospectively by three different people, it is not easy. And the outcome of these people who could not identify the cause of their kidney injury is not good as well. It's 45% mortality at 90 days. The other important uh, finding from this study is that the outcome of hepaturenal syndrome and ATN are equally bad. Before it used to be hepaturenal syndrome is the worst outcome, but now we know that both of them are equally bad. The other point I like to take from this slide is maybe the outcome over the years has slightly improved because historically 20, 25 years ago, the 90 day mortality of hepaturenal syndrome itself was probably 70%. So now if it is 50%, that's probably is slightly better. Another thing we learned is the stage of kidney injury is important. So in this 2000 patient, 34% had stage one, 23 had stage two, and 25 stage three, but no dialysis, and 18% had required dialysis. And as you can see, 90 day mortality was uh, uh, very high in those who required dialysis. So survival was only 40% in those required dialysis compared to people with stage one AKI. The other take home message from the study is that those who progress or do not recover, which happened almost half of the time, 43%, had the worst outcome. Most of them have, or 50% of them have died within 90 days, but those who respond, actually their outcome is uh, much better. So, Having said this, this I want to know how we differentiate between different causes of uh, AKI. This might, this slide is basically what we use in our clinic or how I use use it uh, to think about each single patient uh, we get consulted upon. I look at the clinical examination, make sure that the patient um, has uh, edema or no edema. If he has no lower extremity edema, I know this patient is uh, intravascular volume depleted and we treat it as such. If he has edema, it can be anything. We start with the first with the albumin and reassess response. We look at this urine, make sure there is no nephrotoxic medication. And if there is any of the casts or uh, previous history of nephrotoxic exposure, we consider this ATN. If nothing is there, we consider, consider this as hepaturenal syndrome and uh, we start with the constrictive uh, therapy. But at the other things we look at in the background is blood pressure and uh, urine biomarkers. One of them historically has been the fraction excretion of sodium. So what is the role of systolic blood pressure in differentiating between uh, the different causes of kidney injury? This goes back to this time when we used to do kidney biopsies to differentiate who should get a liver kidney transplant versus uh, a liver transplant alone. And back on the days, we did not have criteria or anything to go upon. So we used to get patients with unknown cause of kidney failure, uh, a kidney biopsy. And this, we published this back in 2019, looking at the experience of almost 130 patients. And these patients had, we grouped them into ATN based on the pathological finding, ATN or normal biopsy, and those with advanced uh, interstitial fibrosis and glomerulosclerosis, mainly because of diabetic nephropathy, and those who had MPGN because of viral uh, uh, glomerulonephritis. And as you can see, the blood pressure was lowest in people with hepaturenal syndrome, which is 13 patients with normal biopsies and those with ATN. But if you have somebody cirrhotic with a blood pressure above the mean or the median in this slide, which is 110, uh, most of the time there is something going on chronically in the kidney. 
Uh, again, this is one time blood pressure measurement, and this is a very selected group of patients. But we, I personally use the blood pressure to guide me. And if somebody with hypertension, for sure, I use this as an indicator that this patient has chronic kidney disease or concomitant uh, 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 kidney damage. Looking again at this biopsy experience, we correlated very well the systolic and diastolic blood pressure uh, with the degree of glomerulosclerosis and fibrosis. So basically, the more scarred the kidney is, the higher the blood pressure in this patient were. And we're able to actually calculate the sensitivity and specificity of somebody with systolic blood pressure of less than 90, for example, at presentation. These patients were most of the time have ATN or hepatorenal syndrome. But if you have a blood pressure above 140, it was specific for actually chronic kidney disease. The other thing we learned from this group of patients that we biopsied that none of the other clinical parameters differed. There are 24 urine creatinine clearance, there are isolamate GFR, but important to this topic is that we learned that 24-hour uh, urine sodium is not any different among them. So urine sodium does not tell us too much how to differentiate between different calls of AKI. Even when we looked at fraction excretion of sodium by diagnosis, so 100% of the time patients with hepatorenal syndrome or normal biopsies had fraction excretion of sodium below 1%, but this happened 80 to 90% of the time in other diagnosis. And although we found it to be sensitive, <coughs> but it's totally nonspecific, in diagnosing hepatorenal syndrome. So it's worse than actually flipping a coin in these patients. And this has been uh, echoed in other uh, non-biopsy studies, like studies like this um, uh, study from Yale that looked at more than 100 patients with acute kidney injury by diagnosis. And as you can tell, all of them had a fraction excretion of sodium below 1%. Yes, hepatorenal syndrome did have the lowest a fraction excretion of sodium, which was less than 0.1%, but uh, FINA actually did not differentiate the cause of kidney disease. <clears throat> what about urine biomarkers? Can we use those to differentiate cause of kidney disease? The word biomarkers sound difficult and complicated, but actually we use biomarkers every day. Creatine is actually a biomarker. Cystatin C is a biomarker. So we have biomarkers for proximal tubular injury, distal tubular injury, and so on. And of these biomarkers, some actually stands out like NGAL, IL-18, and KIM-1. NGAL is a marker of distal tubular injury. IL-18 and KIM-1 are markers of proximal tubular injury. And you can see here in ATN patients, NGAL was much higher than patients with hepatorenal syndrome or perirenal azotemia. Same thing with KIM-1 and IL-18. So it could be useful, but the problem with the biomarker is that it requires the accurate timing. And this is obvious here from this study from Mass General that they did serial measurement of uh, NGAL in uh, more than 250 patients. Some of them actually had no kidney injury, but others had kidney injury because of uh, prerenal azotemia, hepatorenal syndrome, or ATN. And the green line here is the ATN patients. They had the highest NGAL level, but over time, the NGAL, all of it kind of came um, together irrespective of what caused the kidney injury. And there is some explanations or theoretical explanation for that, that what starts initially with hepatorenal syndrome and the healthy nephron without any uh, sloughing of the tubules in the urine, over time, because of the strict vasoconstriction, it starts uh, happening that there will be more and more sloughing of the tubules and more and more release of uh, urine biomarkers. So therefore, over time, you cannot really use biomarkers to the fish to acute kidney injury. You have to do it at the time of diagnosis, but over time, it probably loses its accuracy. This table probably you're all familiar with, but it summarizes what we said so far, that perirenal azotemia is the most common cause even in the main 
in, in the, our current era, hepaterenal syndrome at best is 12 to 15% of the cases. Uh, hypertension or blood pressure is palpably low in every single cause of um, uh, acute kidney injury here, but shock and nephrotoxic exposure is only present in ATN. Ascites has to be present in hepaterenal syndrome to diagnose. Uh, Prerenal azotemia responds very well to albumin. Granular casts are present in ATN, and uh, fractional excretion of sodium is not useful, and maybe NGAL is elevated in ATN patients. I just don't want to leave you here to with the idea that these are the only causes of acute kidney injury. This is patient with uh, polyarthritis nodosa, another one with bile cast nephropathy, and the third one here with compartment syndrome, all of them presented with kidney injury of some sort. Lastly, in the last one and a half minute, I want to tell you what's happening in the chronic kidney disease field. It's not a good news, and we know this um, from the study that looked at UNOS data from 2002 to 2017, and they divided uh, these patients to uh, uh, different eras and de defined chronic kidney disease as persistently low GFR for 90 days. And as you can see here, in, back in the day, 2002, the risk of chronic kidney disease was only 12%. Nowadays, it's 17%, so it went up quite a bit. And the, we should ask ourselves why. One main reason is the increase in the NASH and the concomitant diabetic nephropathy. Another thing has to do with the definition changes that we are facing that now there is no more hepaturenal syndrome type 2 is being called hepaturenal syndrome CKD. So that will add more to the diagnosis of CKD. In addition to classical reasons for CKD in cirrhotic patient like IgA nephropathy and MPGN with viral hepatitis. <clears throat> Another important reason why CKD will keep on going up is that I think survival is getting better with the treatment of AKI. So you end up with patients who recover from their kidney injury, but end up with chronic kidney disease at uh, the end of the uh, time. Because if you look at this study, 400 patients with decompensated cirrhosis uh, uh, got hospitalized. A third of them developed AKI, 168. Within three months, many of them died but 97%, 97 of them have survived. So that's much better survival again than before. But unfortunately, out of this 97, 24 was left with chronic kidney disease. So better care of kidney injury patients in, cirr in cirrhosis, yes, makes them probably live much longer, but not with normal kidney function. And that's a sad news because the uh, one year mortality compared to those who have normal kidney function, CKD patients actually have one and a half times risk of dying, and patients who develop acute kidney injury on top of CKD have 2.8 risk of dying within one year. Back to the case, uh, we looked what caused this kidney injury in this patient, and we looked at the urine, there was no bile casts, there was no granular casts. We don't do urine electrolyte because I don't really believe in it, his blood pressure was right in the middle. I could not use it to diagnose uh, one way or the other. So we started the album and he showed some response. The next day of album, he got some response, but we have been very worried lately about volume overload with album. So we use it very carefully. The hepatology service started metadrine uh, but his kidney function stayed the same. Eventually, his creatinine came down on his own to 1.7 and stayed there since for the last one month. So I assume this guy, this is the best we're going to get out of his kidney injury, and he will end up with some form of chronic kidney disease at the end. So in summary, I just want to say that the diagnostic criteria of kidney injury and hepaterenal syndrome has changed, but still hepaterenal syndrome uh, is the uh, least common cause of acute kidney injury in this population. 
kidney injury has bad prognosis, and it doesn't matter if it's hepatorenal syndrome or ATN, but what happens with the kidney stage and the response to treatment is important because it correlates with 90-day survival. Systolic blood pressure uh, might differentiate what caused the kidney injury. You and biomarker will come one day to our clinic. Be careful with the CKD because it's on the rise for multiple causes and is associated with higher mortality. Uh, try to follow us on Twitter. We have good discussions sometimes. And uh, thank you and again, and we'll be happy to take any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Hani, for this wonderful overview. And please uh, join me to invite Dr. Fred Gordon. Fred actually is a professor at Tufts and the co-director of the abdominal transplant program. Good luck with this. Just approved. And he is a Cothello New Jerseyan, as you can hear from my accent. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for inviting me to speak on this uh, very interesting topic on the use of albumin in the outpatient setting. So we'll start with a few fun facts about albumin. It's, uh, as we know, synthesized in the liver only. Uh, the half-life is 20 days. It's about uh, 50 to 60% of our total circulating protein, so not all of it. Uh, it does account for about 75% of our plasma oncotic pressure, but it also has non-oncotic properties. It uh, binds um, drugs, it reduces inflammation, uh, and affects uh, the immune response, and also has a role in endothelial function. <clears throat> so this may be a little bit difficult to see, but uh, on the top, you have a picture of albumin in a healthy individual, and uh, it's got normal oncotic uh, properties. Um, that you can see there on the right-hand side, non-oncotic properties that I mentioned a little bit earlier, binding, antioxidant, endothelial stabilization, uh, and immunomodulary effects. Uh, albumin in patients with decompensated cirrhosis, though, is not just a lower production, and, and the value is not just in its oncotic uh, properties, but it's actually structurally damaged. Uh, it's oxidated, glycated, truncated, and dimerized. Uh, changing the shape and the uh, of the of the albumin, and that therefore impairs the uh, functions that we talked about, and so it's no longer a good antioxidant. It's no longer a good anti-inflammatory. And so, at this point, I'd like to introduce the concept of effective albumin concentration. It's a at the moment, it's a global concept of uh, the function of the albumin, both encompassing the uh, oncotic and the non-oncotic properties. Um, and it's at this moment not very easily measurable, but at least conceptually, we can understand that the albumin uh, uh, protein is there for both of these properties. And of course, it's back to the slide I showed you a second ago. It's related to the preservation of structure. So when we give exogenous albumin, the goal is to actually restore the effective albumin concentration to overcome the damaged albumin by putting in healthy albumin. So I'm going to talk uh, very, very briefly about large volume paracentesis and the use of albumin in that setting. I will have one slide and defer to uh, Dr. Vadi, who just spoke, and to the speakers this evening about discussing AKI and HRS. Uh, and I'll spend most of the time um, talking about long-term albumin administration in the outpatient setting. Uh, I will not talk about SPP because we all know, and that's pretty easy uh, to use the, the, the one and a half and one gram protocols on day one and three. So large volume paracentesis is associated with an increase in cardiac output, decrease in uh, peripheral vascular resistance, arterial hypotension, hyponatremia, diminished survival, uh, we are all aware that it, uh, decre it increases renin activity. The RAS system is activated. Uh, there was a study done uh, in 1988 by the Barcelona group of 105 patients randomized to receive large volume paracentesis with or without albumin. And the um, endpoints of either hyponatremia or renal impairment, only 2% of the people receiving albumin had either of those endpoints where 21% of the controls had either hyponatremia or renal impairment. Um, and subsequently, there were a huge number of meta-analyses in 2012, 17 randomized controlled trials were analyzed and showed 
improvement in both hyponatremia and mortality. And then seven years later, uh, 25 trials were uh, analyzed. This one lost the uh, demonstration of mortality, but uh, there was improvement in hyponatremia in patients who were receiving albumin uh, after paracentesis. And so the uh, major societies uh, incorporated this into the guidelines. The AASLD says if uh, five or more liters are removed, administer six to eight grams per liter removed. EASL says if five or more liters are removed, go just straight to eight grams per remove, uh, to remove. Uh, and again, bottles come in 12 and a half and 25, so pretty much round off. Um, smaller volumes uh, have less hemodynamic impact, uh, but uh, in patients with uh, ACLF, it's probably best to use intravenous albumin regardless of the volume uh, because they're so fragile with uh, regard to their renal function uh, and electrolyte imbalances. And here again, we see that uh, the concept here is to use the anti-inflammatory process uh, properties of, of albumin rather than just the oncotic. Here's my one-click slide uh, on AKI and HRS and CKD. Uh, and just to say that, uh, think about that there may be a role for patients with HRS, CKD, um, uh, with outpatient albumin use. Um, but uh, like I said, I'll leave that to the, uh, to, to the experts uh, earlier and later. So now we'll get to the uh, to the the bulk of the discussion today uh, on the long-term term use of albumin uh, for ascites. So uh, ascites is the most frequent decompensating event with five to 10% of compensated cirrhotics developing ascites annually. Uh, so that's a building uh, number of patients every year, and it has obvious impacts, hospitalizations, peritonitis, hepatal renal syndrome, hernias, uh, ventilatory dysfunction, quality of life is severely impaired by these patients. Um, and the mortality is, of course, reduced with one year mortality at 30%, two year at 50%, and five year at 70% once ascites is developed and a previously compensated cirrhotic now decompensated with ascites. So in an effort to uh, see the for, what the role of uh, intravenous albumin in a more chronic, a uh, long-term use, uh, this trial was set up uh, and carried out in Italy. It's called the ANSWER trial. Uh, this trial enrolled 431 subjects with uncomplicated ascites, and they didn't really define uncomplicated, but I took that to mean uh, no SBP uh, and <clears throat> no renal failure at the time of enrollment. Uh, they uh, excluded patients who had refractory ascites, and that also was undefined, um, <clears throat> but uh, somewhere uh, buried in the text, they kind of mentioned more than two paracentesis in a month. Uh, before the before enrollment uh, disqualified you. So perhaps their definition was two paracentesis in a month. Uh, patients with TIPS and transplant uh, were also excluded. Uh, it was open label, randomized, controlled, and it went up for uh, to 18 months of treatment. And it compared patients receiving standard medical treatment, SMT, which is more than 200 milligrams of spironolactone per day and more than 25 milligrams a day of furosemide also receiving dietary advice and receiving paracentesis as needed, and compared that to patients who received standard medical therapy plus albumin, HA human albumin, 20%. Uh, the dosing here was 40 grams IV twice a week for the first two weeks, and then once a week for up to 18 months. So patients were frequently uh, in the office to, uh, to get their in uh, intravenous infusions. Uh, somewhat of a busy slide, the uh, left-hand vertical column are the complications that were measured. Um, <clears throat> in the um, dot graph in the middle, uh, the patients who received albumin are the ones that are in blue dots, and the ones who just had standard medical therapy are in red dots. And on the right is the, uh, the, the p-values, and you can see that almost all complications were improved with, uh, with in the group of patients that received the albumin at that uh, weekly rate. So less SBP, less uh, non-SBP bacterial infections, less severe hepatic encephalopathy, less renal dysfunction, uh, less hyponatremia, less hyperkalemia. It did not have an impact on variceal bleeding or other portal hypertensive bleeding. Um, not entirely surprising. 
but these are all statistically significantly different. And uh, they, they reported uh, in the middle there that incidence rate, which is kind of a poor man's hazards ratio. Uh, and you can see the reduction in, in risk uh, that ranges from about 30 to 70% uh, for each of these complications. <clears throat> this uh, looks at hospitalizations uh, in comparing the two groups. So all cause hospitalizations were reduced uh, significantly. Liver related hospitalizations were reduced significantly and total days in the hospital were about half uh, for the patients who were receiving albumin compared to the ones who just had standard medical therapy. Uh, the non-liver related hospitalizations were about the same. And this is an analysis, there's a lot of data that came out of this study. This is an analysis of the 12-month incidence of each of these events. So therapeutic paracentesis occurred about three and a half times over 12 months in the standard group and only one and a half times in the albumin-treated group. Uh, refractory ascites was reduced by about 50%. And again, some of the things that we talked about before, um, <clears throat> less hospitalization uh, slightly. Uh, and on the bottom, though, you can see that the number of times that the patients had contacts was vastly different, uh, at least for the administration of long-term albumin. So these patients were had eyes and hands laid on them a little bit more frequently uh, at 48 to zero. Uh, and I'll get to that zero number again in a minute. The time to the first paracentesis was uh, certainly prolonged uh, in the patients after enrollment uh, for the ones who received albumin. And you can see on that Kaplan-Meier curve, statistically significantly delayed onset of first paracentesis. And on the right-hand side is the uh, <clears throat> incidence uh, of these events. So we'll start in the pink on the bottom. Tips and liver transplantation was about the same in both groups. Non-liver related deaths were about the same in both groups but liver-related deaths were reduced, uh, as you can see, by about 50% uh, on the right-hand side in the patients who were receiving standard care plus human albumin. So the uh, eventual observations that came out of this trial was that there was a 38% pre uh, reduction in hazard ratio for mortality. There were similar side effects in the two groups. And the, one of the big concerns going in is that the patients were gonna become volume overloaded, but that actually didn't happen. Uh, importantly, the albumin levels in the standard group were 3.1 at the beginning and 3.1 throughout the entire 18 months that didn't change. The albumin treated group started also out at 3.1, so well matched, uh, but went up to four after the first month and then stayed at four throughout, and that was statistically significantly different. Uh, the one month albumin level directly correlated with the 18 month survival. The critique of this study was that it was open label. Uh, and the patients who received albumin had far more healthcare contacts, uh, and so perhaps that biased the uh, results a bit. Now, published in the same year, 2018, was another trial, the MOCT trial. Uh, this came out of Barcelona. Uh, this enrolled 196 patients who were listed for transplant. So again, a little bit of a different population than before. Uh, this one was truly blinded, so patients uh, received their treatments uh, completely blinded in, to the uh, patient and to the uh, to the caregiver. Randomized placebo controlled for up to 12 months. They received midadrine, five to 10 milligrams three times a day, and 20% albumin, 40 grams IV every two weeks. So different uh, dosing schedule by quite a bit, almost by 50% because patients were receiving weekly albumin in the previous study. And they, uh, the other group received placebo midadrine and placebo albumin. They came in for infusions of uh, presumably saline. Uh, the primary endpoint in this study was any of the complications of cirrhosis. So uh, renal failure, hyponatremia, infections, encephalopathy, and GI bleeding. Uh, this study, however, did not show any difference in complications between the two groups. Um, you can see the lines overlap there. And also on the right-hand side, the survivals were also about the same in both groups. There was a, a modest effect on the RA system here. Uh, renin activity, aldosterone activity uh, was a little bit lower, um, but these are things that were happening on paper and not having so much of a clinical outcome. So uh, this trial, um, did not meet its primary endpoint. Uh, they offered up as reasons potentially that midadrine was providing inadequate vasoconstriction. 
uh, that the amount of albumin was insufficient. Um, in this study, both the treated and the placebo groups, their serum albumin went from three to 3.4 at week 12. Interestingly, the interesting that the uh, placebo group also had an increase in albumin without infusion. Uh, and perhaps there was insufficient duration of treatment because the mean duration of treatment was only three months, even though it was a 12 month study, patients were not prevented from getting transplant. And so uh, the, the uh, midadrine albumin group actually only on average uh, received uh, about 10 to 12 weeks of uh, treatment. Uh, and yet they were included in the, uh, of course, included in the, um, in the analysis and on intention to treat. So the lessons learned from here uh, are perhaps that the overall goal is to try to repair the effective albumin concentration and restore the physiologic functions of albumin, both the oncotic and the non-oncotic pressure, which is shown graphically on the right. So as your albumin is dropping, you wanna try and drive it up. Um, and again, the, that study, uh, the answer study told us that four was a pretty good level to be at to show some of these improvements. Um, and so, if we're looking for targets and based on the data from these two studies, uh, it looks like albumin has to be given in high enough doses to correct your hypoalbuminemia and perhaps four is the right target. Although of course, nobody ever really looked at 3.8 or 3.7, but right now all we have is four and that the duration of treatment is important. Uh, and you can see this is the answer data on the right-hand side of the survival. And you can see that the two lines begin to diverge at about the two to three month mark uh, and so that also may be a reason that the mock trial uh, wasn't successful because patients really weren't on it much longer than that. Uh, and so you didn't get to see that separation uh, of survival. So the consensus uh, literature opinion is that long-term outpatient albumin administration is likely going to become a universal guideline recommendation for cirrhotics with uncomplicated ascites. Uh, further individualized dosing may be the target here, uh, trying to achieve an albumin level of four over weeks. It doesn't need to be done in the first week where you absolutely load them up uh, because there is a risk of uh, fluid overload in these patients. And so some just getting there, that level of four over the first month or two will probably be adequate. Short-term treatment does not appear to be ineffective, uh, but the logistics of accomplishing all of this are clearly acknowledged. And then the, uh, the elephant in the room here is what's the cost effectiveness of all of this. <clears throat> and so uh, the answer, again, tons of data came out of this answer study. So they um, <clears throat> did an ICER quality per quality analysis, and it came out to be about uh, 21,000 euros, which is equivalent to about 19,000 US dollars. And the arbit, not quite arbitrary, but the accepted uh, measure of cost effectiveness is anything that was less than 35,000 euros. So this meets cost effective criteria uh, in the answer data. Now there were two subsequent analyses of the answer data, one performed in Mexico and one performed in Spain. And I put the graph up of the chart up of the, the Mexican analysis over there on the right hand side. And you can see all of the uh, things that contributed to the cost here. And in the middle column, the SMT plus LTA long-term albumin group, you can see about uh, four down, the cost of the long-term albumin was 119,500 pesos. Um, the follow-up visits were another 28,000 pesos. The albumin itself was 91,000 pesos. There's a lot of money there. Um, however, if you go down to the lower part, or halfway down, it's well counterbalanced by the reduction in admissions, the reduction in encephalopathy management, the reduction in uh, SBP, uh, the reduction in AKI and non-liver non related hospitalizations. And so their conclusion was there was actually a 1,600, well, a 33,500 peso, which is $1,670 US uh, per patient savings by administering this uh, schedule that they uh, followed in answer. Spain uh, did another analysis. I don't show it to you here, but it's uh, very similar. And again, a $1,229 or 1,400 uh, euro savings per year by giving this uh, this treatment. So future directions, um, you know, we'll need biomarkers. Perhaps albumin is a good biomarker. If you hit that level of four at four weeks, then you're you're on the road to success. But there may be others that we can look at, CRP, uh, cell death markers, uh, fatty acid binding proteins. 
And then some way, if we can figure out how to measure the effect of albumin concentration, that would actually uh, be our best biomarker. And then we really need to define the patients who are most likely to benefit um, who is too sick for this. And, and you may get an answer in this in the MELD score. So the answer trial, which again, showed positive outcome, the average MELD score there was 12 to 13. And in the mock trial, the average MELD score was 16 or 17. So 15 perhaps could be a tipping point. If you're below 15, you're going to benefit. If you're above 15, maybe not so much. Uh, but remember, there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of biases and a lot of problems with the mock trial. And then we also have to define who's too early. You know, first time you show up with ascites, are you now committed to weekly albumin for the rest of your life? So these are all answer questions that need uh, some solutions in the future uh, before we dive into this directly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gordon. And now we're going to the other side of the spectrum from hepatic encephalopathy to artificial intelligence. So let's welcome Dr. Uh, Simonetto from uh, Mayo Clinic to discuss this very important topic. Okay, round two. So, Briefly, for this talk is more of a high level talk, you know, not as much practical because this is still at a research level. We talk briefly about definitions of artificial intelligence to set the, the, the stage. Then we're gonna talk about potential applications of artificial intelligence in machine learning in chronic liver diseases in hepatology using some studies that have been recently published using that technology and then end with some limitations and pitfalls of artificial intelligence and why we're not quite ready or prime time. So briefly, artificial intelligence is a pretty broad term and has become pretty much a buzzword now that really encompasses, is an umbrella term that encompasses any machine that is capable of perception, logic, and learning. And that includes not only machine learning, but also robotics, for example. Now machine learning, which is what we're gonna be talking more about today, refers to a set of algorithms that can learn from data whether in a supervised or unsupervised manner to make decisions and predictions. And within machine learning is deep learning, which is a type of neural network, most commonly used as a convolutional neural network or CNN, that learns without the need for extensive programming or feature engineering. So this is becoming important because historically, we have been focusing on EHR data, structured EHR data to make predictions. And the performance has not been the greatest, but it has what we had thus far. Now we're able to leverage much more rich data from different, different sources, including individual at the individual level, at the physical environment, with the use of wearables, for example, also genetics and biology with omics data, and finally at the population level with socioeconomic factors. So we need tools that will be able to process and make sense of all these different data streams that are available to us so that we can improve on our prediction of outcomes, specifically in this case for our patients with liver disease. A couple more definitions that I'll be referring to today is regarding the data and the machine learning method. So the data can be classified as structured or unstructured data. So structured data refers to what we know or what we use, which is numeric tabular data that can be stored in a data set. That's what we are familiar with as opposed to unstructured data, which is data that cannot be stored in a data set. That refers to images, for example, radiologic, pathologic images, voice, endoscopic images, anything that cannot be stored in a numeric sense in a structured way. And the machine learning methods can be classified in supervised and unsupervised. So the difference here is that supervised machine learning models, we have the ground truth. We have an output. So we can label the outcome they were interested in, and then we can train a machine learning algorithm to reach that outcome. Unsupervised machine learning methods are when we actually do use an unbiased approach. And what we do is we ask the machine algorithm to cluster the data into different sets based on similarities. So that's commonly used for omics data, for example, large amount of data we don't necessarily have or sometimes don't have an outcome of interest, but we wanna see similarities and then explore the differences after we have the clusters available. So this is 
busy figure, but just to illustrate the potential applications of artificial intelligence or machine learning in hepatology, in the predictive modeling that we can use to predict fibrosis, complications of cirrhosis, transplant outcomes, using not only routine clinical and laboratory data, which is structured data, but also unstructured data sources. So radiology-based imaging, pathology-based imaging, multi-omics data, large complex texts from clinical notes can be leveraged using natural language processing, and also real-time by monitoring data from wearables, for example, which are becoming increasingly available and used by our patients. So walk through some examples of machine learning studies that have been done and published. So this first one was done by our colleagues, John, John Eaton and Costa Zaridis and Mayo, where they developed a predictive modeling using structured health data, in this case, laboratory tests, age, and years since PSC diagnosis to predict risk of poor outcomes in patients with primary sclerosis and cholangitis. And the outcomes were decompensation and cholangitis. They called this score the PRESTO, PSC risk estimate tool, and they used a gradient boosting algorithm, which is a type of machine learning algorithm that uses decision trees. So it's based on rules, not so much in mathematical formulas. And they found that the Presto score was superior to previously published methods, such as the MELT score and the Mayo PSC score. And on the graph, you have the weights of the different variables that were included in the Presto score. Another example is from the UC Irvine group led by James Tabibian. They developed also a machine learning algorithm using structured health data, in this case, also laboratory tests in the presence of ascites. They call their score eVendo score, and that was used, that was developed using random forest method, which is also a decision tree-based algorithm, similar to granite boosting. And they found that the eVendo score had a good performance with an AOC of 0.82 in the testing cohort to predict the presence of varices and varices needing treatment. So using this score with selected cutoffs, they were able to potentially spare up to 40% of endoscopies while missing less than 3% of varices needing, varices needing treatment. And on the right, we also have the different weights for different variables that were included in the Evando score. So this is a different approach using uh, omics data. So this is a clustering method, as I mentioned, unsupervised, in this case, semi-supervised machine learning method where part of the data was labeled, but not the whole data set. And the idea was to identify clusters based on transcriptomic data or signatures that could identify drivers of disease progression also in primary sclerosis and cholangitis. The authors did adjust for the presence of fibrosis and fibrosis-related genes. And after doing that, they were still able to identify, as we can see on the right, two clusters. A cluster that was associated with a lower risk and a cluster in green, and a cluster associated with a higher risk of PSC progression. And you can see that over a period of two years, those in the higher group, higher risk group, higher risk cluster had higher uh, probability of decompensation. Now, switching gears to unstructured data, and this refers in this specific case to radiology images. In this particular study, they used deep learning, a convoluted neural network to apply to shear wave elastography of the liver to predict or estimate the presence of liver fibrosis in patients with chronic hepatitis B. So they applied this methodology and found the AUC in too good to be true AUC of 0 0.97 to predict F4 um, with uh, AOC of 0 0.85 to predict moderate fibrosis stage F2. Now, this study does have some methodological flaws, uh, particularly the testing cohort where they applied the algorithm to was somewhat different than the, the derivation cohort. And that's really important. We talk about the pitfalls at AI of AI at the end. So this is uh, an also, another deep learning uh, algorithm model that was used, that was developed using unstructured imaging data. In this case, pathology, liver biopsy slides. So this was led by Jamie Bosch in Barcelona Group. And they developed a machine learning algorithm, another CNN, to predict hepatic venous pressure gradient. So they had over 200 patients with NASH cirrhosis that had liver biopsies done and also had HVPG measured. 
and they found that their algorithm, which they called MLHDPG, correlated significantly correlated with true HDPG, and it was able to predict clinically significant poor hypertension with an AOC of 0.76 sensitivity specificity mark here. On the right, we can have some examples and note that for patients B and C, the amount of fibrosis was similar because you may be wondering whether it's really detecting the fibrosis in not so much anything else. And this is a deep learning. We talk about the black box concept to the fact that we can't really know exactly what the algorithm is using to make its prediction. But they compared the patients B and C, which had the similar amount of collagen, about 13%, but had significantly different HVPG, 12.5 and 22. And you can see that their machine learning algorithm was able to predict that difference um, with a reasonable accuracy. And now switching gears to a um, more recent study using 12 lead electrocardiograms. So this is a proof of concept study that was published just this past year, where we wanted to explore whether 12 lead EKGs would identify specific signals of cirrhosis. So because it was a proof of concept study, all patients enrolled in this first pilot study were patients with advanced liver disease. So essentially patients with cirrhosis undergoing a liver transplant with cirrhosis at the indication and without other less common indications for transplant. So over 5,000 patients were enrolled in the cirrhosis group and over 20,000 patients in the control group without liver disease. And again, this was just identify a signal, very simple. The output labels were cirrhosis versus not cirrhosis. And we trained a convoluted neural network that provided a continuous score from zero to one that could then estimate the strength of the cirrhosis signals on the 12 lead EKGs. And what we found is that it does appear that 12 lead EKGs can potentially detect the presence at least of advanced cirrhosis or decompensated cirrhosis for the most part with an AOC in the testing cohort. So this is a cohort of patients that the model had not seen before of 0 0.908. And using a threshold of 0.17, we had a sensitivity of 85% and a specificity of 83%. So pretty promising results again, with the caveat that these are patients with pre-advanced cirrhosis, you may be wondering, okay, what is the utility of that since you can tell whether the patient has cirrhosis. So this may not be necessarily good for screening, but could it be used to predict outcomes in this population? So this is from the same study. We looked at the trend in ACE score over time up to the time of transplant and following liver transplant, those patients that underwent liver transplantation. And you can see that the years preceding transplant, dating back more than five years, up to the time of transplant, the ACE score progressively increased until it peaked at the date of transplant. And all of our patients, at least in the male health system, including Florida and Arizona, all have an EKG at the time of admission for transplant, so before the transplant. And that's usually when the ACE score was peaking. Following transplant, the ACE score rapidly decreased over the course of one to two years, suggesting that the EKG signal we're picking up might be specific to cirrhosis. I do not have included here, but we did adjust for use of beta blockers, which is an important confounder that we had to adjust that did not impact the performance of the model. We adjust for comorbidities as well. And so far we haven't been able to identify what exactly is the 12 lead ECG picking up on. Many of those patients had normal sinus of rhythm on the EKG without any abnormalities detected by cardiology. So there is something else that the machine learning algorithm is picking up on those EKGs that can tell us whether the patient has cirrhosis or not. And we'll go back to the black box concept of the deep learning models and the fact that we, there are ways that we can overcome that, but it does require additional, additional work. So this is unpublished data, but was presented at the liver meeting uh, two meetings ago, two years ago. And we wanted to explore further whether the ACE score had prognostic value. As again, this was trained in patients with advanced disease, so maybe not useful, at least at this stage, for diagnosis and early detection, but could be useful for prognosis. So now we included a cohort of patients with compensated cirrhosis, asymptomatic patients, and we found that the ACE score could significantly attack the presence of decompensation with an AOC of 0.93. And using a threshold of 0.25, sensitivity nearly 90% and specificity of 
Along the same lines, we wanted to know whether the ACE score could predict liver-related death. So now we, we see on the Kaplan-Meier curve on the left that a high ACE scores, especially higher quartiles, and a blue line at the top is the toppest quartile, a score between 0.75 and 1, was significantly associated with a risk of death up to five years following the initial EKG compared to the yellow line, which is the patient population with a score in the first quartile between 0 and 0.25. And when we adjusted our score for not only melt sodium, but also by age, comorbidities, cause of liver disease, the ACE score was still able to predict the risk of decompensate, this risk of death, excuse me, with a hazard ratio of 1.42. So with that in mind, we wanted to compare the ACE score with the melt sodium. And we found that the AOC was actually pretty similar, just the ACE alone, just using the EKG, no additional data, no labs, just the EKG alone could perform equally good, equally well to the melt sodium alone. But when combining the two, we had a better performance. So maybe there is value to adding the A score potentially to the melt sodium to predict mortality, 90 day mortality. So that led us to hypothesize that maybe the A score is picking up on something other than labs, other than melt. Maybe the A score is predicting severity of portal hypertension and decompensation, which would be of value for patients that we all know have low melt score and have significant decompensation, which currently are disadvantaged by the organ allocation system, which only is based on melt and melt sodium. So with that hypothesis in mind, we looked at the performance of the ACE score in a subset of patients with melt sodium equal or less than 15. So either alone, ACE and melt sodium had similar performance, but when we combine the two, the ability of the models to predict 90-day mortality significantly increased with an AOC of 0.87. Obviously, this needs to be further validated, but so far, promising results suggesting that we can use 12 lead EKGs to estimate risk of death in this population. So, finding, finishing up with limitations in future directions. So, it's important to acknowledge that AI has a lot of pitfalls, and also the AI or machine learning is not the answer to everything. So, using complex machine learning models in simple data sets or skewed data sets will not result in good results. So the performance is dependent on the data quality, which requires a lot of data cleaning, especially for dealing with big data, and not on the complexity of the model. In fact, there's a paper by uh, the Nexel group, which will look, developed a machine learning algorithm to predict 90-day readmission for, from hospital discharge. The model did not perform any better than traditional models historically. So more complexity in the model does not mean better results. So then to keep something in mind. Another caveat with AI research and machine learning models is the lack of standardized reporting, particularly when the research is being done by data scientists versus physician scientists, because the language that we use is different, and we don't have good ways of reporting the data that can lead to confusion at times on the utility of those models. Explainability, at least in the medical science, is quite important because we're gonna be, if we're gonna be using these models in the future to help in the management of our patients, we wanna know what exactly are these models looking at? Is that plausible? Or this could be lead to poor outcomes and we're not understanding what, how the model is leading to those, um, to those uh, recommendations, if you will. So it's really critical that we apply explainability models to our deep learning uh, neural networks to have at least some level of understanding of what exactly is the model using to make those recommendations. Currently, there's no consensus though or guidance on which models to use on their performance or even their interpretation. And with the same bu first bullet point I mentioned, it's important to recognize that AI models can lead to biases, particularly because of the black box concept as we don't know what the model is looking at. So the model, if you don't know what it's using to make predictions, then that can lead to significant biases. There's actually one good example of a study that was done during COVID where a group used chest X-rays to predict mortality, or excuse me, to predict the diagnosis of COVID-19. And the algorithm performed extremely well and they used different centers. 
And when they apply an explainability model to understand what the algorithm was looking at, it was actually looking at something outside the chest with just some marker on the x-ray when the patient was in isolation that led to more likelihood that they had COVID-19. So it was nothing to do with the lung imaging, it had to do with something outside the chest that indicated the patient might have COVID-19. So again, biases are really important and explainability will help us address that. And then finally, how are we gonna implement that in our clinical workflow? As more of these models are being developed, we need to keep in mind the, the workload that's gonna create and the burden on clinicians as well. Um, so something to keep in mind for the future. And I will stop there. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for this wonderful review. And I would like to ask the panelists to join us. Questions, please, Dr. Saab. Great. All the talks were fantastic. I have a question in particular for Dr. Mitchell about the type of alcohol. Um, do we think that type of alcohol may make a difference, particularly like the sweet cocktails and you know, and could that help explain the gender differences in terms of outcome? Uh, thanks. That's a that's a really great question, Dr. Saab. And I think that one of the things that we have to keep in mind is this issue of drinking during meals, drinking outside of meals. And if you look at what's drunk outside of meals, largely that's uh, beer and cocktails. Um, sometimes wine is drunk outside of meals, but wine is drunk more often with meals. We did a study a number of years ago looking at rates of absorption of alcohol. And the higher the concentration of alcohol, meaning if we took um, vodka, mixed that with um, um, a soft drink and you know brought it to 20%, uh, which is you know 40 proof, and compared the rate of absorption of that drink with the rate of absorption of beer, the blood alcohol levels go up faster and they reach higher peaks with that concentrated alcohol than with a less concentrated alcohol. So it may be that we're getting higher peak concentrations of alcohol in the liver at those times when we're drinking outside of meals. Dr. Reddy. One more question. Oh, I'm Dr. sorry. Please. Dr. Gordon, love your talk. Um, the, you know, when people, you know, we take off more than five liters, we give albumin. Should, should that paradigm change depending on the patient's height or weight? Um, based on kidney function, blood pressure, like Dr. Uh, that, that the nephrologist talked about, we make some adjustments based on other factors, just more than just some volume of ascites taken out. I, well, so the, the volume has been shown scientifically to, to that, that amount actually works uh, in preventing some of the complications, but uh, I'm sure further refinement, um, you, you just told me about half a dozen great studies to look at, um, <clears throat> but uh, Probably, uh, but right now we are uh, where we are. Great. Uh, okay. Uh, the question for Dr. Mitchell. Uh, great talk. Uh, so we we when we talked about the metabolic syndrome and interactions with with alcohol intake and, and also uh, the genetic predisposition, we do know. So I'm, I was actually working on this problem, we know, we know that the severity of metabolic syndrome differs by race and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. We also know that distribution and the type of drinks and the frequency, and also going back to during drinking, not doing drinking, also binge drinking has racial and ethnic component. Do you think looking at this increase, this, this synergetic effect that we factor in the, the race ethnicity with the predisposition, are we going to see differences or maybe look at much more elevated risk in some groups versus mm -hmm. others, also factoring in sex as well, knowing that females are more susceptible. Yeah, so I think you, you've really done a nice job of outlining the complexity here. Uh, what I tried to do was, you know, for purposes of learning is to try to simplify what are the things that we should look at, but there are many unknowns here. And, and you've touched on, on several of those because um, the way in which people use alcohol and consume alcohol differs. And, and there are a lot of cultural differences there. And so we really do need to take those things into consideration when we're designing uh, studies. Uh, I think that as we go forward, what we all need to remember is that when you take a history of drinking from your patients, you do need 
quantity and frequency, but that needs to go beyond that to how many times a month are you drinking more than six drinks on occasion? Are you drinking outside of meals? And a lot of those things are culturally driven as, as, as you suggested. So I don't have a good answer for you yet, but I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of important information there. Excellent. Please. Um, uh, that was a great talk on alcohol, uh, Mac. Uh, the, do we have some data on the darker side of this, meaning the addiction? In other words, are the data on a polygenic risk score for the addiction or a GWAS base? Because obviously the, we are figuring out the genetic susceptibility to alcohol-induced injury, but if you can put it together with the risk for the addiction that would be the perfect storm type of patients to identify. Yeah, I think that's a that's an important issue. There are genetics, you know, genetic studies related to risk of developing an alcohol use disorder. I think the, the the difficulty here is that those studies haven't been very conclusive. There are clearly differences in alcohol dehydrogenase, the major enzyme metabolizing alcohol in the liver, and there are differences related to aldehyde dehydrogenase, the major uh, enzyme detoxifying acid aldehyde. And we know that those patients who are genetically deficient in ALDH2 are less likely to drink, less likely to drink to excess. And But what's interesting is that even if they do drink to excess, there doesn't seem to be any additional harm. And that's one of the things that's been perplexing in this field. Um, I, I think there's going to be a lot more studies coming out on looking at that. But again, I think um, alcohol is a, a, a risk factor in a lot of um, situations that we've not necessarily thought about in the past, because as we look at some of the more recent studies, even the idea of alcohol and its relationship to heart disease is probably mediated through its effects on the liver. And the same might be even true for extrahepatic cancers, including colorectal cancer, where there's a higher incidence in people who are drinking heavily or breast cancer. And there again, having liver disease is a risk factor for those things as well. Great. Dr. Reddy. Yeah. Uh, question for Mac and then one for uh, Fred. So when you go on the liver service, what you see now is just alcoholic hepatitis. It's, it's really impressive. Uh, and you and I have been around as hepatologists for a long time, and I've never seen anything of this nature. So this young person comes in, high meld, gets transplanted. Um, and we've published on this, others have noticed this. They have the shortest waiting time and the lowest waitlist mortality. Um, and too much to a point where one commented the other day, these alcoholics are sucking up the livers. So what do you think is going on? I mean, do you just blame this on COVID or uh, or something else, and I'm not able to explain this phenomenon. Uh, do you have any insights uh, into this? You know, Raj, you've you've raised a, a really critical question here. This this trend began before COVID. I, I showed one slide comparing 2006 and 2016, and the percentage of young patients with alcohol-associated hepatitis and alcohol-associated liver disease had increased. I mean, it's a larger percentage of the total for the younger population. It accelerated during COVID without any question, uh, but that trend had started before. And again, if you look at these patterns of consumption, you know, there's been a shift over time to people drinking more concentrated drinks, drinking more drinks per occasion, as compared with just drinking, you know, a couple of beers, uh, after work or, you know, a glass of wine with dinner or whatever. And I think that, that, that there's going to be a, a, you know, that's really where this is, is all going to come out in the end. Now, with regard to your comments about liver transplantation, I think that's something that, that uh, all of us have been uh, seeing and, and are troubled by. And, and, you know, we know that the, the six month rule might not have been the best rule, but I think as we begin to look at better ways to treat patients with alcohol-associated hepatitis and whether shorter duration of steroid treatment might reduce risk of infection and lead to better survival. You know, I think we might have to rethink this idea of just transplanting a, a young patient, particularly just because the MELD is 32 or 33. 
uh, Fred, if I may. Okay, so so uh, that was a nice uh, overview. So, you know, in this terms of this outpatient albumin, I'm not so sure we have, as you, you pointed out, do we have the final answer on, on this? Yeah, to that end, there's a study in the US called the Preciosa study. Um, and the cost effectiveness analysis that was in Europe, I, I'm not uh, sure it'll apply the US. Yeah, you got the facility fee, you got the patient uh, nursing fee and all kinds of things. So I think the, um, the jury's out there for that. And then uh, I know you, you talked about outpatient albumin. Any thoughts on this inpatient uh, use of albumin, uh, this uh, study that uh, the ones done in the UK, the tire study? Uh, certainly, uh, I think there's a flip side to albumin that we need to really keep in mind. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm for albumin, but there's a huge flip side where they actually saw greater rate of pulmonary complications. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so I think uh, the you kind of touched on the answer. I think, you know, the patients that are inpatients are clearly more acutely ill and are certainly going to be more subject to the risk of acute fluid overload and, and the drive to, you know, get the patient quick, uh, better, fast, uh, putting the albumins up in the four territory within days. Um, and so, and again, these are patients that are acutely ill, highly inflammatory state. So, uh, so I agree. It's, it's a different, uh, it's a different question, a different kettle of fish. Mm. Uh, as far as uh, adopting and the whole process uh, and those numbers, you know, there were, those are Italy, Mexico, and Spain, and and that breakdown certainly won't hold up in, in, with U.S. Uh, numbers. Uh, insurance companies are not going to step forward to pay for this unless it's in a guideline, uh, and I think that's uh, quite some time away. Yeah, just to interject a little bit on this, because if you look at the MAC trial, the mean was three months, not even the median. When I hear mean three months, the median is going to be a little bit lower. Right. And the other component is, what are we treating? For example, you see tonsillitis, 500 milligrams of amoxicillin, seven days you are done. Which is the metric? What's the dashboard for albumin in order to achieve this? Uh, again, that's <clears throat> that's where we need more information is maybe something as simple as a CRP will, will be the answer to that. Just get that CRP dropping and we're, we're in better shape, uh, yeah. maybe more complex. We just wrapped up the Preciosa trial. It's going to take a little bit longer, and we will see the results from there. Dr. Rusky. Uh, this question is for Dr. Dip Simonetto. You know, the, the, the implications of AI in society are global, and certainly in medicine. They're already using it for discharge summaries, et cetera. Um, with, what are the... What is the Mayo Clinic doing about the ethics of what's being uh, incorporated into medicine already? I'd be interested in knowing what the guardrails are at your institution. Yeah, I think so. There are several guardrails at the moment. So that's why, as I mentioned before, I don't think we're quite ready for prime time, except in the use cases as you mentioned, we can use AI tools to help expedite kind of our workflow and decrease the burden in terms of doing notes. Um, we're doing some work on potentially using AI to help transcribe notes in the patient room while we're doing the visit with the patient. So those are easier use cases for AI when it does not lead to changes in management of patients, right? Because I think for there, we need more work, a lot more work uh, to make sure that we don't have an introducing bias and especially for the deep learning models, which are the most promising ones that have better performance that can introduce that in our, in our care. So in Mayo, we do have several stages for the AI research we have to accomplish before we're ready for prime time to use those predictive modeling in patient care. Um, that requires external validation. So as I mentioned before, these models have been developing in, in healthcare, are being developed in tertiary care, in academic centers, right? So the population in those centers is quite different from the general population in rural communities, for example. So we need to make sure they are generalizable first um, and it's externally validated extensively in diverse populations before we can use them. So that's a requirement. Within Mayo, we don't use these scores yet to dictate care. Uh, we have to first go through the steps to validate uh, testing different populations before we can do that. And the last question is coming from Stan. He is the CMO of uh, Ocelot and New Trial. He's on board with uh, early pressing 2.0, like. 
Stan. Thanks very much. And um, the, the question actually relates to the first discussion on the use of urinary sodiums, uh, et cetera, and uh, differentiating the different uh, forms of kidney injury. And uh, it was uh, interesting that uh, urinary sodium doesn't, uh, is a poor discriminator. My question is whether um, it's, uh, it discriminates better in terms of the response to therapy for the different forms of, um, uh, for the different forms of kidney injury. So in other words, could you use it after you've treated a patient to help to distinguish the different forms um, at all and whether it's uh, predictive at all? Well, that's a very good question, and thank you for uh, getting me engaged in this discussion with your question. <laughs> Otherwise, I would be have left uh, bad, don't say. But, <laughs> uh, but to be honest with you, all the studies that looked at urine sodium only looked at it at one point in time. And its accuracy come, or its fame come from time of admission actually. So all the study who looked at initial presentation urine sodium, and that's where the fraction excretion of sodium less than one came from. So while patients are hospitalized, they get all kinds of things, from IV fluids to albumin to all this uh, other diuretics, and all this would affect the urine sodium. So it's persistent monitoring of urine sodium has not been done, but it's, it's going to be also very difficult to interpret because many things are being, you're not keeping the patient in the hospital and not doing anything for them. You're either giving them Lasix, you're giving them fluid, you're giving them albumin, which is, by the way, has a lot of salt fluid with it as well. So I think it has not been done, but my guess, it might not be very useful mainly because other factors are being involved. Uh, I think too, we probably need to move forward with other things like the urine biomarker and cystatin C. I don't like when I hear from or read in papers saying cystatin C is not readily available. It is readily available. It's available in most centers. You just have to order it more often so it gets resulted faster or your lab get more interest in it probably if you have uh, more access to urine biomarkers or there is now maybe kits that look at multiple different biomarkers at the same time and that's something i think we need to use in the future and move away from the urine sodium exceptional we would like to thank our wonderful speakers and uh let's get a short break we'll see you back at 10 15. thank you so much all right uh well welcome back and uh wondered if we could take your seats so we'll get the session going please come along all right Okay, while you're taking your seats, uh, let me kick off this session. I'm Raj Reddy. I'm a hepatologist at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm going to moderate this uh, session that deals with certain aspects of complications of cirrhosis, actually one of my favorite areas. Uh, and to that end, uh, we'll start off with the first talk uh, to be delivered by Dr. Marina Serper. Uh, Dr. Serper uh, is my colleague um, and is a very accomplished uh, hepatologist uh, in the academic world who's a rising star. Um, she has multiple hats and um, multiple areas of interest, like uh, assessing adherence to drugs in the transplant population, bioinformatics, telemedicine, sarcopenia, etc. So, Marina, it's really a Pleasure to have you here, and you're going to talk about potentially preventable complication strategies to decrease uh, readmission rates. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for having me and for the invitation. So today, here's the structure of my talk. We'll first talk about the burden of admissions and readmissions for cirrhosis. 
We'll talk about some of the challenges and also opportunities in preventing readmissions. And I'm going to use uh, some examples in the literature. We'll talk a little bit about future directions, and I'll give you some evidence-based tools that you could take back to your institutions. So there have been numerous articles evaluating admissions and readmissions and cirrhosis. So one that I'd like to highlight was published recently in 2020, where they looked at this large database called the National Inpatient Sample, where they looked at all admissions of patients with chronic liver disease from 2012 to 2016. And so in terms of the burden, um, the median length of stay for patients with cirrhosis admitted for any reason was 6.3 days. The in-hospital mortality was very high from 7 to 13%. And there was a cost of $18,000 per admission, and the global burden in this database as of 2016 data was somewhere around uh, north of $80 billion per year, so very, very costly. Another paper looked at the most common and costly reasons for admission, and these you see every day if you're a practicing hepatologist. These were alcohol use disorder, alcohol-associated hepatitis, and the standard decompensations that we see, hepatic encephalopathy, ascites, HRS, et cetera. Risk factors for inpatient death are having a older age, having a longer length of stay, obviously decompensations, additional medical comorbidities, the need for invasive procedures, as well as poverty and economic disadvantage. And pulling a lot of studies, as you see here on the right, Overall, readmissions for cirrhosis at 30 days are somewhere between 25 to 30%, and really overall, this settles out at about 26%, so very high readmission rates. Why do we care about readmissions? We obviously want to help our patients. We want to prevent uh, preventable readmissions, so no patient should be admitted just for a large volume paracentesis. For example, we should prevent readmissions that are due to hepatic encephalopathy if the patient has been inadequately treated, for example, not started on rifaximin for their index HE admission. But the other reason, of course, to prevent readmission is these evolving payment models. We're not going to go into the details, but I put a, um, a link here for you at the bottom. Medicare has been experimenting with alternative payment models for about 10 years. Some of you on, who work on the health system side may be aware that private insurers are increasing, increasingly going towards bundled payments for episodes of care and not necessarily fee-for-service payments. So we do have to be mindful that readmissions actually could be costing us money. And so this is a paper that was alluded to in the previous session by Dr. Simonetto. Uh, this was a uh, data from the Naxel cohort that wanted to build a predictive model for readmission. I find this paper is very, very interesting. So this is a Naxel cohort that many of you know, 14 North American centers. They looked at greater than 2,000 patients who survived at least 90 days and performed a predictive model for 90-day readmissions. So the most common reason for admission were infection, HE, bleeding, and ASARCA. These were sick patients at academic centers, length of stay 10 days, ICU was 16%. The overall readmission rate was just average, as I showed you before, 28%. And they did a variety of machine learning algorithms um, looking at structured data. And what they, they showed was that if you think about an AUC a C statistic for a model of 0.8 being a pretty good predictive model, they were not able to predict, predict readmissions very well. So it was somewhere in the 0.5 to 0.6 range. And all of these clinical parameters they put in the model did not perform better than melt sodium. I have ideas about this. And I think the main reason is that different practice patterns at different institutions will uh, impact patient care differently. So it's very, very hard to fit one size fits all models for readmissions. I think it's hard to think about generalizable medical knowledge when you're thinking about how to prevent readmissions. This really has to be done locally. We did a study a few years back with Elliot Tapper where we hypothesized that 
we hepatologists, gastroenterologists maybe provide more evidence-based care in the hospital. And is that associated with lower readmissions? So first of all, we wanted to see, but we looked at VA data and then a commercially insured database optum. So we looked at 20,000 patients in the VA admitted with decompensated cirrhosis and 222,000 in optum. So very, very large and distinct cohorts. And first we saw what, and, and these are hospitals where there was inpatient GI or hepatology care available. So first of all, um, only 42% of admissions had, or nearly, yeah, 42% had specialists involved. And these are decompensated admissions. It was more common to have specialists involved with ALKEP and with SBP, and less so for other indications. And then we wanted to see what was the impact on inpatient consultation versus not on all of these parameters. So inpatient consultation did not impact inpatient mortality. Um, however, 90-day mortality was higher with inpatient consultation for both cohorts. I think this is very easily explained by the fact that sicker people get you know, consulted, you know, consult specialists more often. We also found some interesting differences by health system. So inpatient consult was associated with an 8% decrease in readmission rates in the VA, which is an integrated system of care. So down from 39% to 31.5%. This was not the case in the optum cohort, and that is not an integrated system of care, at least that's my hypothesis. We also found that inpatient consultation was associated with more linkages to outpatient care, even though th this was not associated with mortality. So I think, again, the message here is that different health systems and different care patterns will have different outcomes. And so why are the challenges? Well, each hospital has its own practices. Not everyone has radiology on call, let's say, to do a large volume paracentesis. Not all hospitals have GI available 24-7. And uh, not, not all hospitals have transplant centers, of course. It's only a minority. The other thing we need to be aware of is not all readmissions are preventable or inappropriate. They're very appropriate admissions and readmissions that occur. So we're really trying to find the patients with the problem and try to prevent things that are preventable, not all readmissions. And then we also have to be aware that not, of our, not all patients are getting readmitted at the same hospital. So we may have readmissions that are just happening somewhere else. So many challenges. So we'll talk about a little bit of low hanging fruit. And again, this is just examples from the literature. You could think about how to apply in your own setting. We'll talk about things as simple as checklists, access to early post-discharge care, application of just evidence-based care if it's not already applied. And then we'll talk a little bit about remote monitoring and I'll show you some QI quality improvement resources. So this is, I say this is slide and wisdom from Elliot Tapper, but I ascribe to this as well. You have to first know what the problem is. You're not going to just tackle a problem that's not actually a problem and you need to know what is the scope of the problem. So you have to measure what your problem is, find the patients who might benefit, assign either additional resources or change your workflows, and then you have to remeasure and do it all again and iterate. And by the way, probably no one is paying you for this. So you have to be aware that you have to fit this somewhere into your day. This is a paper that I wish I would have seen be replicated in other settings. This is sort of a famous paper in our you know, health services research literature from Morando in 2013. Uh, from a journal of hepatology. So this is a cirrhosis day hospital model. This is patients from Italy who are admitted for a cirrhosis decompensation. And they're randomized to coming after discharge to a cirrhosis day hospital that has everything that they would ever need. And they would have like a five to nine hour stay in this day hospital. So they would have a team that would talk to them about all the evidence-based things that evidence -based things that have to happen in cirrhosis. So if they need a paracentesis, if they need an endoscopy with banding, if they need help with alcohol use disorder, medication management, et cetera. What's interesting here, the control group who was getting usual care also had the ability to go to this day hospital just for invasive procedure. They actually kind of gloss over that in the paper, but I think it's important because the, the day hospital model actually improved mortality by a significant amount. And also here are the differences in readmissions, one year 
all cause and liver related mortality and global costs. So even though some of the control arm was able to cross over into the day hospital treatment, there was still a very potent effect of this day hospital. So 15% readmission in the care management day hospital arm versus 42% standard of care. The mortality was half, 23 versus 46%. Liver related mortality, 15 versus 36% and cost savings. And again, I have not seen this replicated elsewhere and I would love to see an integrated model of care for cirrhosis. And could we convince insurers to think about paying for such a model? This is a study uh, that Elliot Tapper did. So now we talked about a very kind of resource intensive model. Here we have a much simpler model. So this was work that he did actually, I think as a GI fellow um, at BI. Basically they came up with a quality improvement checklist. So um, it was targeted towards SBP treatment, SBP primary prophylaxis in the hospital, and also starting titrating lactulose and starting rifaximin for people admitted for HE. And they had three phases. This was a pre-post design. The first phase was just a paper checklist, iterate the checklist of what needs to be done. Um, the second phase was roll it out into the EHR and then measure, okay? And so um, actually, I'm trying to go back. So what they found was that there was a reduction in 30-day readmissions and particularly for hepatic encephalopathy. So again, a pretty simple idea. I'm not showing you the checklist here, but this was things that you already know to be evidence-based. Uh, this is you know, SBP, hepatic encephalopathy, and the checklist was implemented both on the primary hepatology service and on the hospital service. So I think this is a, a nice study. If there is a barrier and there is a problem and there's low hanging fruit, then you can tackle the problem. Here's a study that one of our former fellows who's now faculty, Shazia Sadiq, did at Penn. I think this is a great local QI initiative. So they started, so they wanted to uh, do something in cirrhosis. So they identified first admissions that were less than three days for cirrhosis, because most people would agree that those were medically uncomplicated and potentially preventable admissions. They talked to clinicians. I think they talked to Dr. Reddy, and it was well recognized that being admitted just for a large value, volume paracentesis was something that was happening and was clearly a problem. And so they implemented this system. They talked to a lot of people in the ED and the ED was interested in this as well because patients would sit for a long time waiting for admission. So they implemented a procedure team that was available from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., seven days a week. There would be an expedited triage for large volume paracentesis. Uh, for patients who came from the outside and patients who were sent in from hepatology clinic, there was a fast track where those patients directly, there was a phone call made and they were able to get a faster paracentesis. You, this does not project very well, but there was a paper checklist that talked about what you're supposed to do. Uh, what is the workflow? A patient could not have a fever or AKI, any other symptoms. This really had to be just for LVP. Albumin uh, procedure was there to be administered. And so what they were able to find is that they were able to reduce the length of stay in the observation unit by 20 some hours, so from 45 hours to 26 hours. And they were pretty much able to prevent all admissions for just large volume paracentesis. And there is some type of model like this that's still at Penn. So this is a great example of a QI initiative. There was a clear problem and this is scalable and is now part of standard of care. Here's another study. Uh, this was um, also comes from um, Michigan, where it was an inpatient pilot study looking at an interruptive alert for rifaximin for patients who were admitted for hepatic encephalopathy. Rifaximin is a part and parcel of what we do, but it is not necessarily known, for example, on the hospital service that rifaximin should be added to lactulose for an HE admission. And so this alert was able to reduce 30-day readmissions by 23% and was more potent in HE. So this was built into their EPIC EHR. There were two types of alerts, interruptive and non-interruptive. They didn't report if one performed better than the other, but this was a pilot
pilot study, and I don't think they had the sample size for that. This is uh, from Mayo. This was not um, an intervention, but it is uh, a retrospective study that I still think is uh, valuable. This looks at, uh, this is a retrospective study that looked at early linkage to care for alcohol use disorder within 30 days of hospital admission. And so the take home message really was that if patients were linked to alcohol use disorder resources and rehab within 30 days of uh, initial admission, their readmission rates were decreased and so was their relapse. Okay, let's see. And so for the last part of my talk, I am gonna talk a little bit about remote monitoring. Remote monitoring has a lot of promise. There's still a very much early and building evidence base for it. So there are no kind of gold standard practices for remote monitoring and cirrhosis, but as you know, yourselves, your patients are increasingly using wearable devices. So how can we leverage that? And by the way, most of our patients text and most of our patients readily access the internet and other resources from their phones. So there was this recent study in the Journal of Hepatology of this CiroCare remote monitoring model. So it looked at 20 patients and they were enrolled in this digital health system where this is just in between visit care monitoring, a sort of like a telehealth model where the patient was able to communicate with the study team about any problems, submit biometric data and, and all ki other kinds of parameters that I'll show you in the next few slides. So there were 20 patients enrolled. 15 of the 20 had good engagement with the platform, so they actually used it. The median MELT score was 16, and they did not, and they compared this, I think, to another cohort of 60 uh, who are controls. There was no reduction in 30-day readmission rates per se, but there were fewer days spent in the hospital by the patients who were enrolled in the program. I have my own kind of views of this program. This is certainly interesting and innovative, but I think about my patient with either overt or subclinical HE. And even though this is very nice, you can report your weights, you can do animal naming tests, you can do all other kinds of tasks, report what you ate and your symptoms. This is nice, but this either involves a very alert and activated patient or a very involved caregiver. So I think that this is a very good model, but how do we actually implement this? How do we make this simple enough for our patients and how do we increase use? I think that is yet to be determined. And there, there's a lot of uh, different thresholds and alerts with this. So I think that this is a very, very good idea for that, again, motivated or very alert patient or one that has really good caregiving 24 seven. And I wanna conclude with this study. I don't know if anybody is kind of a statistics nerd like me and looks at the Christmas issue of the BMJ, but this was a study that came out that I don't know if some of you have seen this, uh, it evaluated the role of parachute use to prevent death and major trauma when jumping from an aircraft randomized control trial, 92 private or commercial aircraft passengers randomized to jumping with a parachute or an empty backpack. And I don't know if any of you have seen this at all. So here are the primary outcomes of, uh, you know, what happened after impact. So there were no differences in death or major trauma. Uh, whether on impact or 30 days after impact, either in the parachute or the control group. So what's the punchline here? This is what it looked like. So this is, uh, you know, one of the subjects jumping out of the airplane. And I also did a cost effectiveness analysis here. Here's, you know, your cost of parachute and cost of fancy anti-slip mini ladder, right? So this really should frame for you of you have to go where the problem is. You have to measure the problem and target the problem that you have. Um, and you should not be intervening on patients who do not need intervention. And you should not be throwing resources at problems that aren't actual problems. So in conclusion, cirrhosis readmissions are frequent, costly, difficult to measure. I showed you some tailored solutions of how to reduce readmissions. And I think a lot of this has to be done locally. So I'm sharing with you some um, QR codes. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has uh, lots of nice uh, prompts and webinars and checklists that you can start to use in your own practice. And there's also formal 
QI methodology training available. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marina. So the next speaker is Jen Lai. Uh, Jen, I've known her for quite some time. She is uh, an endowed professor at UCSF, and she is indeed remarkable in that she's devoted her career to studying frailty and sarcopenia. And I don't believe there's anyone in this country who's done more work in this area than Jen. So it's really a pleasure, Jen, to, uh, to have you here. And thank you very much for taking the time to come out and speak to us. Thanks so much, Raj, um, for the introduction, very kind introduction. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, um, although it's always very difficult to follow Dr. Serper, who's such a great and engaging speaker. So as we begin to talk about this idea of managing frailty and sarcopenia, we really have to understand what exactly we're talking about. I think we all have a sense of what frailty is just as a word. I mean, we all know a frail patient when we see it. But in fact, you might be surprised to know that frailty is a formalized construct. It came originally from the field of geriatrics. It is defined as a distinct biologic state of decreased physiologic reserve and increased vulnerability to health stressors. Now, if I were to portray this construct of frailty in a figure, this is how I would do it. Frailty is really the patient's physiologic reserve. And I want you to think about two patients with cirrhosis, both of whom have all other factors being equal. They're both, you know, the same gender, the same age, they have the same MELD score, the same degree of portal hypertensive complications, but one is not frail. So that person has high physiologic reserve or at least a normal physiologic reserve. Um, and that is the person in the dotted line at the top. Uh, let's see, do I have a, oops. I don't have a laser pointer, do I? Okay, and the and the other one is the one on the bottom, the solid black line who is frail and has lower physiologic reserve. Now, both of these individuals will be subjected to the same acute stressor. You know, we do know our patients with cirrhosis get SVP, acute variceal bleeds, and will come into the hospital and both will experience pretty much the same amount of depletion of their physiologic reserve in response to the acute stressor. But you will see that this frail patient who already didn't have a lot of gas in their tank is this episode is going to propel them into this zone of adverse outcomes. This is the patient who gets C. diff as a result of antibiotic therapy from their SBP. This is the patient who gets the clot because they're not mobilizing. This is the patient whose acute kidney injury ends up um, requiring dialysis and has a harder time getting out of the hospital. So this is why frailty is so important. It's pretty clear, I think, to anyone who's managed a patient with cirrhosis, why our patients are so vulnerable to becoming frail. There are so many uh, contributing factors from head to toes, starting with encephalopathy, going down to their hypermetabolic state and their hypercatabolism, um, the hepatic synthetic dysfunction that occurs from their cirrhosis, the compression from their ascites that uh, really doesn't allow them to eat very well or absorb their nutrients as well. These factors lead to the state of chronic undernutrition and chronic reduction in activity, which then leads to sarcopenia or depletion of muscle mass, which then leads to what we see in clinic in our patients or in the hospital as manifested as physical frailty. They're decreased in their physical function. All of this makes these factors worse. You know, the, the, the patient who's not moving is the one who um, is who's who, who can't eat as well, um, whose encephalopathy gets worse. They can't actually uh, process their ammonia because they have less muscle mass. So this is just a vicious cycle that just gets worse and worse. If we're going to get to this idea of um, managing the frail or sarcopenic patient with cirrhosis, um, we really, I, I would classify this management strategy in three steps. The first is to understand the impact. The second is to assess frailty. And the third is to implement strategies um, for managing the patient with frailty. So let's start with understanding the impact. So Patients who are frail with cirrhosis are physiologically older than their chronologic age. Uh, in a couple of studies that I put together, the average patient with cirrhosis in the studies right now is between 55 and 60 years old. 
And what we found in our study at UCSF is that about one in five are frail as classified by the Freed Frailty Index, a classic geriatric uh, metric of frailty. One in three report difficulty with at least one activity of daily living. This is a pretty remarkable finding because activities of daily living are the basic activities that we need to just function within our home. This is feeding oneself, going to the bathroom, bathing oneself. I mean, just super basic activities. And one in three report um, difficulty with uh, one of these activities. And the average VO2 max is about 18 milliliters per kilogram per minute in another study with cirrhosis, this is equivalent to a community dwelling adult who is 85 years old. So in other words, using objective data, our patients with cirrhosis are physiologically three decades older than their chronologic age. So it's no wonder why when our patients are sitting in the hospital or walking into clinic, they look so much older than their, than their stated age. Frailty has been strongly uh, associated with death and decompensation in patients with cirrhosis. This is just one of the many studies out there. This was a three, a five center study of over 800 patients with cirrhosis. They were all, they had their frailty measurements um, ambulatory in the ambulatory setting. And you can see very clearly from the top blue line that the probability of death or progression is significantly higher in frail patients than those who are pre-frail or those who are robust. So if we're sort of building on um, Marina's talk before, if you're looking for a risk factor of who is at risk for adverse outcomes, who's at risk for decompensation, who's at risk for hospitalizations, I would argue that this might be a very important predictor to measure. Uh, the same is the case with sarcopenia. So when we're, at, we're actually measuring the, the muscle mass of the patient, this is a meta-analysis of over 7,000 patients with cirrhosis uh, that was just published last year. So it's really, I think, one of the most important sarcopenia studies out there. And you can see that the overall prevalence of sarcopenia in patients with cirrhosis across the global studies of sarcopenia in this population, the overall prevalence is about 30, is 37.5%. And you can see notably much higher in patients with alcohol associated liver disease than um, non alcohol associated liver disease. Um, and uh, sarcopenia is, like frailty, an incredibly strong predictor of mortality. You can see that the the top the top blue line where it says 93, 82, 74 at one, three, and five year uh, cum cumulative uh, survival rates. Those are those are the rates of the non sarcopenic patients. You can see the light gray bars. The sarcopenic patients are at much higher risk of death. And so that is really the impact of, of frailty and sarcopenia. But of course, you don't need me to really tell you that frailty and sarcopenia are risk factors for patients with cirrhosis because we can just, we, we know it. If you see a patient in the hospital, one who can move and mobilize on their own and another patient who can't, we know which patient, just as clinicians, we know which patient is going to die faster. And so I really want to focus on how we can start integrating this concept into our clinical practice to, to really bring this to the bedside. So the first is to assess frailty. Um, Elliot Tapper said it best, as Marina just alluded to earlier, you have to first just sort of measure the risk um, and measure who is at risk and identify those people. And so part of managing the frail patient with cirrhosis is to identify them. So I'm just a high, I want to highlight uh, three tools that could be used in our clinical practice to measure frailty um, in, a, in a pragmatic way. And the first is the liver frailty index. It is an index that was developed uh, by my team at UCSF and consists of three performance-based tests, uh, grip strength in the dominant hand, uh, five chair stands, and balance testing in three different positions, 10 seconds each. It takes less than 90 seconds on average to complete in the outpatient clinic setting. Um, it is a test that um, can be embedded into EPIC. Um, our, our medical assistants actually do it in all our, uh, trans, our listed patients and cirrhosis patients with the vital signs. So they actually have this hand dynamometer in the, the um, blood pressure basket and the temperature basket. So they do blood pressure, they do the grip strength, and then they measure their temperature. Frailty, as measured by the liver frailty index, is strongly associated with death and sort of in this linear fashion. You can see here in this study that was a multi-center study um, across uh, eight centers in the United States, the risk of waitlist mortality in patients with cirrhosis actually increases as the liver frailty index goes up. 
Now, of course, not everybody can do the liver, not every clinic setting and practice setting is set up to do this performance-based test in the um, outpatient clinic setting. And it's not always necessary to spend this 90 seconds to do this test on every patient with cirrhosis. It just depends on what you need a frailty assessment for. And so I want to offer you two additional tools that are sort of more rapid um, that, that we can do very easily at the bedside and start to standardize our frailty assessments um, in for our patients with cirrhosis. The first is the clinical frailty scale. This one is what I, it's a classic geriatric tool. It's been around for many, many years, originally developed um, by uh, the Rockwood Group in Canada back in the 1990s. And um, I would classify it as a standardized eyeball test. We can all do this one. You can see the pictures that they seem, that they come out kind of very clearly in terms of, um, they, can, they sort of match with our patients. Um, but then you can also see the descriptions. So the cut point for frail in um, that predicts mortality in patients with cirrhosis has actually been found to be four. So five or above. So if you look at five, let me just read it to you. It's mildly frail. These people often have more evidence slowing and need help in high order IADLs, such as finances, transportation, um, and shopping and walking outside alone. So you can imagine a lot of our patients with cirrhosis um, actually fall into this category. And in an important study by Punita Tandon and and um, her team, they did find that this uh, cut point of um, five or above was really strongly associated with, with twofold higher rates of death or readmission and um, much higher risk of just death alone and again, hospital readmission just by, based on this clinical frailty scale alone. So a tool that could be used and put embedded into your electronic health record as just another vital sign, but at least a way to objectify and standardize your assessment. The second tool that I want to mention is the Karnofsky performance status. And this is yet another rapid frailty assessment, but just standardized. It's a scale of zero to 100. So very intuitive with 100 being normal performance status and zero being dead. And and um, you can see these cut points, you can see this classification of A, B, and C, in which um, the B, just look at B, it's from 50 to 70. So, so 70 is somebody who doesn't require assistance, but can care for self, but is unable to carry on normal activity or to do active work. So this is someone whose who's chronic condition is impacting their ability um, to do some of the, th the higher level things that they want to do in their daily life, but doesn't need full assistance. And you can see in this, uh, this graph from a study of patients with cirrhosis, how important um, uh, Karnofsky performance status is to classifying uh, the cumulative incidence of death or deterioration. It really helps to risk stratify our patients who are the most vulnerable, such so that we can devote the resources that we have, the, the scarce resources we have to manage frailty and sarcopenia um, to those who are in greatest need. And so finally, once you've assessed frailty, how do we manage frailty and what are some of the strategies that we can use? So before um, the this the nutrition talk uh, was actually scheduled before mine, um, the, uh, you you will actually get this afterwards because I think there was a delayed flight. So um, I thought it was going to be covered before, but you will be hearing, this is a spoiler alert, you will be hearing some really in important key points, three points about uh, using nutrition to help manage frailty and sarcopenia. The first is to ensure that the patient takes in adequate calories at 15 kilocalories per pound of body weight per day, that the patient take in adequate protein, 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.7 grams per pound of body weight per day, and then take in a late evening snack. You'll, you'll hear more about this in the following talk. But what I really wanted to talk about is to build upon the, the fundamentals of nutrition in cirrhosis patients and talk about um, a few other concepts. The first is exercise. Exercise is formally defined as activity requiring physical effort carried out especially to sustain or improve health and fitness. I bring up this definition here today because I think a lot of times we, we, we interpret movement as exercise, but actually exercise has to be a little bit more intentional. And although we certainly want to be encouraging our patients to move as much as possible and to, to walk and to saunter around, we kind of want to set, I think we should be setting a much higher bar for them. And we should remind them that just moving around in their daily life or their job is probably not sufficient to achieve the kinds of health benefits that we're looking for. 
One strategy to really get at this exercise issue is to embed this single item physical activity measure into your assessment of, of exercise in the patients. And this single item physical activity measure is, in the past week, on how many days have you done a total of 30 minutes or more of physical activity, which was enough to raise your breathing rate? What I love about this question, and it actually has been studied in the non-cirrhosis population as, as actually a, a, a quite accurate metric of how much um, activity a patient is, a, an individual is doing, is that at first it allows us to standardize exercise, okay? Because, you know, I feel like I don't, I don't get out a lot out of just the, the, the general question, oh, are you exercising? And they say yes. And then kind of that's the end of the conversation, but that doesn't really help our patients go more or get more. Um, the that when you ask the question, you're conveying to the patient what you want them to do. You wanted them to do 30 minute chunks um, of activity that was enough to raise the breathing rate. So that's, you're already sort of defining exercise for the patient um, by asking the question. And the third purpose of this question is then patients a lot of times want to say, well, what's the right answer? How many should be, should I be doing? And the right answer is based on the CDC recommendation of 150 minutes per week. So really the right answer is five days a week. Um, not that we should get our patients all to five days a week immediately. I mean, but most of us may not even be doing five days a week, but but you can at least start at a baseline and the patient might say zero and you can say, okay, great. Well, when, when I see you next at the next clinic visit in three months, I would love for you to be at one. And so we can start sort of setting some goals for our patients um, and giving them information. What kind of exercise do we want them to do? Be specific about exercise and you can use the FIT recommendations which stands for frequency, intensity, time, and type of exercise. There are two types of exercise we need to be emphasizing with our patients with cirrhosis. The first is aerobic activity and the second is resistance training. And I'd like for you to think about some benchmarks for these patients that when it comes to aerobic activity, we can use the talk test to guide intensity. So they should be short of breath, but still able to talk. That's the level of exercise we want to get them to. And when it comes to resistance training, we can use the rep test to guide intensity, be able to do two to three sets of 10 to 15 repetitions. So as you, you probably note that these sorts of go these goals are set to the patient. This is, I'm not saying they should do 10 pound weights, you know, because 10 pound weights may be too much for one patient and too little for another. No, what they should do is wherever they are, you're meeting the patients where they are and then getting them to a goal, whatever that means, exercise size to you, it's it's when you're short of breath and I want you to do 30 minutes of that or what, you know, wherever your muscle strength is, I want you to be able to do 10 to 15 reps. Um, I love to recommend exercise examples to my patients. Um, you can take a look at these websites, this Northwestern website, and also the National Institute on Aging has some great videos. Um, but I, the chair rise is my favorite exercise. It, it's, you know, you don't need any equipment. You just stand up and sit down from a chair. I tell my patients to do it at the top of the hour, uh, 10 to 15 reps. I guarantee you, if you did 10 to 15 reps of chair rising, it, you would actually, your heart rate would actually go up right now. Uh, the chair dip is great. So in the same chair that they're using with handlebars, um, they can actually lift themselves up, up and down. It's a great uh, upper body exercise for them to do 10 to 15 reps at the top of the hour. And then standing hip abduction. This is something they can just hold on to the back of their chair and they can do these um, leg raises um, to really work on their um, glute strength as well. So these are, and, and they're just using their body weight. So there is no excuse that they can't get to the gym because of COVID or they don't have a ride. You don't need a gym. We have to provide our patients with examples to, to embed exercise into their daily life at home. Uh, I, I recommend embedding some cirrhosis-specific websites. These are two that were developed in part by uh, Dr. Punita Tandon in Canada, um, wellnesstoolbox.ca and cirrhosiscare.ca. They're really reputable cirrhosis websites with videos, and uh, you can you can uh, develop nutrition calculators and personalized nutrition prescriptions. Exercise in patients with cirrhosis has been demonstrated to improve um, many factors, including peak VO2 max, increases muscle mass, 
increases six minute walk test distance as well as increases health related quality of life. There have been a number of studies at this point that have shown that um, it does uh, benefit our patients with cirrhosis and lest you worry that uh, so that exercise is dangerous for our patients. Well, there was one really important study um, by the Spanish group that actually did portal pressure measurements or hepatic venous pressure measurements in patients with cirrhosis after a 16 week exercise program. And in 50 patients with compensated cirrhosis, HVPG actually decreased by 11% rather than increased. So don't discourage patients with varices to exercise. They're not going to pop a varix while they're doing their chair stands. Lastly, I'm going to finish. Oh, I have two last recommendations. Um, the first is going to be to consider testosterone in men with cirrhosis. Um, it has been very well demonstrated that men with cirrhosis are at high risk for having low testosterone. Up to 90% have low testosterone. Low testosterone is associated with sarcopenia, low hand grip strength, physical activity, and quality of life. It has been associated with hepatic decompensation and infections and has also been associated with a high risk of death. Testosterone has been shown to improve muscle mass. This was a very important randomized clinical trial of 102 patients with men with cirrhosis and low testosterone who were given intramuscular testosterone undecanoate, 1,000 milligrams, five, time in, five times over the course of one year. And you can see here very clearly that testosterone showed a significant benefit in terms of lean, improving lean body mass over the 12 months and decreasing fat mass in the testosterone group over 12 months. Lastly, I want to talk about a TIPS. So TIPS uh, has been studied in terms of its improvement in muscle mass. And in 224 patients with cirrhosis, it was uh, who underwent TIPS placement, this was a retrospective study, it turned out that 60% of the patients who had sarcopenia before their TIPS actually were became non-sarcopenic at follow-up after tips. And you can see here in both men and women how the skeletal muscle index, which is a classic measure of, of muscle mass, improved from baseline to two or to five months and one year from baseline in um, on average in the patients with cirrhosis who underwent tips. So I wouldn't go so far as to recommend a tips for um, specifically for the indication of improving muscle mass, but I would strongly consider um, this as an indirect benefit of TIPS and trying to think about putting in the TIPS before the patient really gets far too sarcopenic. So those are the three steps to managing the frail and sarcopenic patient with cirrhosis. First is to understand the impact. The second is to assess it in your clinic using a standardized instrument so that you can then implement the strategies to manage frailty and sarcopenia um, in those patients who are most vulnerable. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jen. Great talks by Jen and Marina. So please have your questions ready. There's a lot of uh, questions that I have, at least. Um, so uh, the next talk is by Marina again. I'll call you back. I'm sorry. Here's two talks for you. Um, and this is actually seriously uh, uh, an important area. This is a big unmet need and a big hole in the hepatology community, palliative care. And as much as uh, uh, you try to implement this in practice. We are not trained in this, and hopefully Marina can give us some guidance on how to implement it in our practice. Okay, thank you very much. So in the next 20 minutes, we are all going to become palliative hepatologists. Okay, so let's go over first palliative care definitions, talk about the benefits of and the barriers to palliative care, what we know um, about what patients think and what clinicians think about palliative care. And then we'll talk about some practical applications and approaches. And mostly I will focus on improving our communication strategies with our patients, advanced care planning, and I'll define these terms. And then we'll talk very importantly about symptom management. This is what we all do as hepatologists every day in clinic, and it actually is a big part of palliative care. So here are for some definitions. 
because we think we know what these terms mean, but maybe we don't. So palliative care is defined as an approach that improves quality of life of patients and families facing a serious or life-limiting, life-threatening or life-limiting illness. Hospice care is end-of-life care for the dying. And advanced care planning is preparation for future decisions about medical care if you become seriously ill or unable to communicate wishes. So this slide, for some reason, got a little bit cut off, but we did a, a review paper where we looked at the benefits of palliative care, and this was primarily in the non-cirrhosis population, but some of the benefits were also shown in patients with cirrhosis. Palliative care is associated with fewer office visits, shorter ICU length of stay, decreased costs, actually uh, improved patient and caregiver quality of life, earlier planning discussion, and overall higher patient satisfaction with care. The barriers are discomfort with palliative care, clinician culture, uh, thinking that palliative care equates to end-of-life care, which it actually doesn't lack of training, lack of reimbursement in the outpatient setting, palliative care workforce shortages, not able to currently meet the needs of the population, and lack of availability of outpatient palliative care. So this was a study done by Dr. Ufere, who's at Harvard, and this was a, when she was a, actually a GI fellow, I think. So she did a comprehensive survey of 384 clinicians who were primarily hepatologists, but some gastroenterologists as well. And this was asking about their attitudes of palliative care for patients with end-stage liver disease. And I remember filling out this survey through the ASLD. And so there are some, so let's look at some of the um, bars that are gray to yellow. So strongly disagree or somewhat disagree. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not going to read all the items to you, but the fourth item that says all patients with end-stage liver disease, including transplant candidates should receive concurrent palliative care. Almost half of the hepatologists disagree with that statement at that time. And actually, if the study was done again today, we might see something different because palliative care has gained a lot more acceptance. Um, there were also perceptions that palliative care clinicians may not be able to adequately meet either the physical or the social psychological needs of patients with end-stage liver disease. So about half or more than half of hepatologists disagreed that palliative care clinicians could handle this population. So very interesting. And then in terms of what were the attitudes of these hepatologists towards liver transplant candidates, um, some, a fair proportion thought that the goals of transplantation and palliative care were contradictory. So 38% believe that. Um, and then some, a, a proportion, almost one in five, thought that patients on the transplant waiting list were ineligible for palliative care. And this is still a prevalent belief at some transplant programs. We did a study with one of our former fellows now uh, at Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Whitsett, we polled uh, almost all transplant hepatology fellow trainees, so at 45 transplant hepatology programs, and asked them about how much they practiced palliative care, how much were they supervised doing palliative care, and how confident or comfortable they felt with certain aspects of palliative care. So here, let's look at the blue and orange bars. This is, uh, these are certain aspects of palliative care that they had done either never or only one or two times. And so they had not typically used caregiver burden tools, discussed and documented advanced care directive, rarely screened for patient anxiety or depression, and rarely talked to caregivers about their burden. And this reflects, I think, what happens in clinical practice to us as hepatologists. And I'm not suggesting that in a 15 or 20 minute visit, we are able to do all of these things. But if we can think of certain components and incorporate even a couple of minutes, and we can work with our palliative care team, I think we could do better than what we're currently doing. Um, we also asked these transplant hepatology trainees, how comfortable do you feel uh, doing the following? So again, if you're looking at the blue and orange, this is not very comfortable and somewhat comfortable. So 
there was a lot of discomfort in assessing managing spiritual distress, which I am not surprised by. And by the way, the questions were all guided by a palliative care framework. So we did not make up the items. These are all items where palliative care experts believe are an important part of like delivering comprehensive palliative care. There was also discomfort about assessing and managing anxiety or depression, fear and concerns about dying. So these are all these uh, aspects that our palliative care clinicians are generally high, highly skilled and highly trained, and we just do not have that same skill set as hepatologists. There's also this belief that patients are afraid of palliative care or afraid of the word palliative care, and they think it's end of life care, and they think it's synonymous with hospice. There was a really important paper published by uh, Dr. Arpan Patel in JAMA Internal Medicine, and he, were, he interviewed patients with decompensated cirrhosis and their clinicians at, at multiple hospitals. And here are the key themes that emerge from these interviews. Patients do not have discussions about what matters to them, their goals and their preferences with clinicians. They don't really endorse that in the visit and they're not asked about it. Patients also felt that optimistic or overly optimistic transplant center attitudes hindered discussions about dying. And so the dis discussions about possibly dying and not being a transplant candidate were not often presented to them. And then death was sort of used by some clinicians as sort of like a threat if you don't do the right thing. So if you don't lose weight or if you don't stop drinking, you will die. So patients also, uh, you know, this came out as a theme in multiple interviews. So clinicians use death to encourage behavior change. And then transplant teams actively avoided discussing supportive care. So this should really make us think about what we're doing in clinic. And also patients thought that their surrogates, their caregivers were generally unpre unprepared for end of life decisions. And so this is a framework that we started to think about. And there are other thought leaders in the ASLD. Uh, there's recently a palliative care guidance um, that came out where we're starting to think about palliative care tools and palliative care training. So again, I'm not suggesting formal training for everyone, but generally medical training involves, you could imagine, you know, hepatology trainee uh, rounding with the palliative care team, doing inpatient, outpatient palliative care rotations, doing structured observed encounters, either with real patients or with mock patients, and also some combination of didactic learning and experiential learning to improve uh, how we deliver palliative care sharing with you a couple of online tools. So one that's well known in the palliative care world is Vital Talk, and it's been developed for patients with heart failure, end-stage renal disease. So this is, uh, and, I, and I have the QR code there, this is really focused on communication. It's focused on what we call serious illness communication. So how do you convey, convey to someone that they have a serious problem that may not be curable? And there are different steps of how to meet, how to introduce yourself, um, how to discuss issues with the patient. Lots of really nice videos here available. Another really important uh, resource is the Schwartz Center. And I don't know if anyone has ever heard of the Schwartz Rounds. So Ken Schwartz was actually a healthcare lawyer and he in his forties was diagnosed with metastatic lung cancer and he was taken care of by doctors in Boston. And he felt that his nurses and other um, clinicians who took care of him were extremely compassionate. And it was some of the best care that he had received was the end of life care. So he started this Schwartz Center and many of uh, your hospitals now have these Schwartz rounds. This is really for nursing staff and for other clinicians to discuss their experiences with dying patients and to share their experiences and to help remove some of the, of the burden and the stress of medically providing care for these patients with end of life care. And so I think this is a really important resource. We're gonna now switch over to some liver disease specific resources. There is an excellent guidance that was just published by the ASLD that goes through the components of um, palliative care. And here we're talking about advanced care planning. This is uh, basically planning for adverse events and decision-making at the end of life. And there are actually steps here. 
um, that you can do as a clinician. So you evaluate a patient's capacity for decision-making. You ask about who wants to be present during the discussion, explain the goals of the serious illness discussion, have permission to share the data first, evaluate what they know, provide to them what their prognosis is, then explore what they want and then document and revisit the conversation. So even though it seems really difficult to have these discussions, this is actually sort of like a playbook and a script that you can use in clinic. And the more you do this, the better you will become at this. There are also some other tools like ask, tell, ask. And there's also the remap framework. The basic principle here is that you first ask for permission to share the information. Once you get that permission, you then ask what they know about their illness. Then you fill them in about the details and you actually tell them what you believe their prognosis is. Then you discuss what they want and then you, you kind of go from there. There's this other framework called best case, worst case scenario. So you either break bad news or you just share with someone, let's say they have HCC out of Milan or out of transplant criteria, it's metastatic. And then you explain to the patient, what are the potential two options? For example, with metastatic advanced HCC, a good option is that we'll get you on uh, systemic therapy and you will have disease remission and you will be healthy and you will be able to do what you want to do for the next few years. And then you think about what would be the worst case scenario for that specific patient. Um, and then you can actually tell the patient what you think is the more likely scenario. So you share best case and worst case, what is likely in your opinion, and then you listen to what they want to do. So again, very actionable, very practical tools. Shifting now from how to communicate with patients about serious illness, the other really important aspect of palliative care is managing symptoms. And we all do this to a various degree in clinic every day for decompensated cirrhosis. So this was a study done uh, by the Practice Metrics Committee of ASLD where they were developing quality measures for cirrhosis and they asked patients to also be part of that process and to rate their symptoms and concerns. So greater than 70% of patients with decompensated cirrhosis thought that fluid, mental confusion, memory and concentration and itching were their most pressing physical symptoms. This is a study that we did um, looking at different quality of life parameters uh, among patients with HCC that were receiving both local, regional, and systemic therapies. And you don't have to so much get into the details of the slide, but this is sort of a heat map of quality of life measures over time. And pink and red is symptom worsening on therapy. Blue uh, is improvement. Dark blue is improvement. So you see a whole lot more red there than blue. And this is just a compilation um, in a systematic review of studies of quality of life for HCC therapy. Now we know when patients with HCC get better, their symptoms also improve, but they do have a lot of physical symptoms on treatment. So again, underscoring the burden of symptoms in cirrhosis. And so what, one aspect that we don't typically talk enough about and are uncomfortable treating in the outpatient or the inpatient setting is pain. And there was actually a really nice review paper in hepatology that was just published about pain. So pain comes in three main flavors. And this was very eye-opening to me because I traditionally didn't think about pain in this way. So pain can be nociceptive, which is caused by actual threatened, um, actual or threatened damage to non-neural tissue, somatic or visceral. So this is trauma type of pain or incisional pain, surgery pain, fracture pain, et cetera. There's also neuropathic pain. We're familiar with this pain caused by a lesion of somatosensory nervous system. And then there's nociplastic pain. This is the pain where the patient tells you they have pain all over their body, but you can't pinpoint any specific issue or why they would be having this pain. And patients with cirrhosis do have this pain that's from altered nociception with no clear or threatened tissue damage or lesion in the nervous system. And we see this quite a bit. So the general approach is, first of all, you emphasize sleep, exercise, 
mindfulness, it can be difficult, especially if you as a clinician don't practice mindfulness yourself. So understanding that it may be challenging to talk about some of these issues, but if you can at least talk about physical activity, you now just received from Dr. Lai actionable recommendations on physical activity. If you can talk about sleep, that could actually improve your patient's pain on a daily basis. And then there are also specific medications that you can use, acetaminophen up to two grams daily, topical NSAIDs. You can use low dose oxycodone or dilaudid as needed for specific issues for, for limited duration. So if your patient's had a hip fracture, you should not withhold pain medication and you want monitor them for hepatic encephalopathy. Um, and then if your patient cannot walk, and needs hip surgery and they have cirrhosis, you can just, you know, use an online risk stratification tool to, to see what there's their risk of surgery. And it's appropriate for many of our patients with cirrhosis to have treatment for their pain that's definitive, such as a hip replacement. And then for neuropathic or nosoplastic pain, there are some other recommendations, capsaicin, tricyclics, lidocaine patch, and then SNRIs, gabapentin, Lyrica, et cetera. And you do have to watch for oversedation. And this paper actually does go through the doses with you. So it's, it's actually a very practical approach. Uh, for additional symptoms that we all deal with, muscle cramps is a common one, depression, anxiety, vomiting, erectile dysfunction, pruritus, they're also specific recommendations. So I, I do encourage you to look at this paper and, and the uh, ASLD guidance. And so basically my recommendations are first to recognize the problem, recognize that all of us are in a sense palliative hepatologists, and we are probably uncomfortable with a lot of the aspects of what palliative care clinicians do. We can all get better, improve your vocabulary, identify your local palliative care resources, and then practice using some of these uh, tools that I showed you. The more you do it, the more comfortable it will become. Also recognize that you're not going to have necessarily always a positive conversation or you will be able to convey everything you want to in one visit or one encounter. Sometimes it takes three, four, five times to explain to the patient and the caregiver their prognosis, especially if things have changed, if they were on a liver transplant trajectory in the past, but now they're not anymore. And so that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Marina. So last but not least important topic is nutrition and cirrhosis. And uh, this is going to be addressed by Dr. Kirtana Kesavarapu, and she's an assistant professor of uh, medicine at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical Center in New Jersey. Uh, she's board certified in gastroenterology and interestingly in obesity. I didn't realize there's a board certification for obesity. In any case, uh, pleasure to have you here and come along. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Okay, so today my topic is gonna to be nutrition and cirrhosis. Okay, um, so here's an outline of our talk today. We'll start off by reviewing the etiologies of malnutrition, discussing screening, and then going into calorie, protein, and micronutrient intake consideration, and then shine a little focus on hepatic encephalopathy. So the liver carries out several vital nutrition functions. It's involved in carbohydrate metabolism and storage by gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, and glycogenesis. It's involved in protein metabolism with urea synthesis and synthesis of non-essential amino acids and uh, plasma proteins like albumin. It's involved in fat metabolism by both producing and storing bile, iron metabolism storage by producing ferritin, which we recognize as a storage form of iron. And it's a repository for vitamin and mineral storage, particularly the fat-soluble vitamins, water-soluble vitamin B12, and trace metal copper. So it makes sense that if the liver is diseased, you can have major nutritional implications. And because of this intimate role that the liver has in nutrition, it's not surprising that malnutrition is very common in cirrhosis. And up to 80% of patients with decompensated disease may screen positive for malnutrition, 
um, on to some degree on scoring systems. And there is a relationship between child's peak score and the degree of malnutrition with A and B um, protein calorie malnutrition being around 21 and 40% and with C being up to 80%. Malnutrition is uh, highest in those with alcohol, um, etiologies for the cirrhosis. And NASH NAFL provides us this really interesting paradox where patients are overweight and obese, but they're undernourished. And there's a number of causes on why patients with cirrhosis develop malnutrition. The most obvious cause is reduced food intake. These patients have poor appetite in general, and it's been attributed to the imbalance between the orexigenic and the anorexigenic hormones. Um, they can have concomitant gastroparesis or early satiety from ascites. The second, and their frequent hospitalizations, right? So we keep patients NPO for long periods of time for testing. Um, we know hospital food is extremely unpalatable, and there's also this delay in food delivery. The second etiology is reduced absorption. There's impairment of bioflow and production that leads to alterations in enteropathic circulation of bile, contributing to malabsorption of long-chain fatty acids and fat-soluble vitamins. You can see concomitant pancreatic insufficiency in patients with um, alcohol and liver disease and concomitant SIBO. We also have to think about metabolic considerations, and we'll talk more about this going forward. These patients have um, higher metabolic rates compared to someone without liver disease. They have impaired glucose metabolism, enhanced protein catabolism. And iatrogenic reasons, we place them on sodium restrictions, which often can make diets quite unpalatable, and for some patients can drop their intake. Um, we remove fluid from the body, and we'll go over a case of someone um, who is an example of this. And then we also induce an osmotic diarrhea, which can result in the loss of electrolytes. All this to say is that multi malnutrition is multifactorial in cirrhosis. I do want to highlight this case of a patient who had been having frequent paracentesis to bring into attention how it can affect nutrition status. So this patient has had eight um, paracentesis, and you can see how much volume was removed which, with each one. Um, and the third line, you'll see how much albumin that they've received. And this patient only received albumin on uh, two of the paracentesis. And on line four, you can see the net uh, protein loss from each paracentesis for a total of 427 grams. And this is a, an estimation um, from the literature that suggests that one gram of, or one liter of acidic fluid removed has about 13 grams of protein lost. And during that time frame, you can also see what's happening to their serum albumin as well. So, um, you know, frequent paracentesis can have an impact on protein loss. So screening in this population is very similar to that of the general population. You'll do a basic screen on everyone. Those who have additional risk factors or screen positive will have detailed screening. And then you send to nutrition planning for those who need it. And here's a nice algorithm. Um, so patients based on their child's Pew score and BMI, you'll automatically send to um, nutritional management and everyone else should get a question, um, a tool, a screening tool, which we'll talk about next. So the Royal Free Hospitalization Nutrition Prioritizing Tool is an easy, quick-to-use assessment tool to screen nutrition status and cirrhosis. It takes about three minutes, and it can be performed by non-specialist staff. So um, it's th about three steps. So the step one, does a patient have acute alcoholic hepatitis? Are they being too fed? And if the answer is yes, they're considered high risk. If the answer is no, you'll go to step two. You want to answer the question, does a patient have volume overload? And if the answer is no, if the, you think that they're euvolemic, you'll answer three quick questions. What is their BMI? Um, have they had unplanned uh, weight loss in the last three to six months? And have they had decreased PO intake and score accordingly? If the answer is that they do have volume overload, do you want to answer if that volume overload is interfering with their ability to eat, decreased intake, and it's resulted in weight loss? And once you've determined these things, you will risk stratify based on their score, whether they're low risk, moderate, or high. Those that are low risk, you'll continue routine screening. Moderate risk, you'll encourage additional eating, offer additional snacks, like intra supplementation. And for high risk, you'll send them for a more formal assessment. So what should a formal assessment include? And this is um, kind of alluding to what Dr. Lai had been talking about earlier. You want to do a global assessment. What is their um, 
weight looking like? What is a detailed dietary intake? What is their muscle mass or global physical performance score? Um, looking at things like hand grip. And when it comes to going to the next step and determining their calorie goals, it really helps to understand energy expenditure. So total energy expenditure is equal to the sum of the resting energy expenditure, physical activity, thermic effect of food, growth, stress, and disease. And the indirect calorimeter is the gold standard for measuring resting energy expenditure, but it's not widely available in the clinical setting. It's quite expensive. Handheld calorimeters have been validated in cirrhosis and can be used, but again, not present at all centers. We have predictive equations like Harris-Benedict and Mifflin-St-Jor that can be used to estimate expenditure. And oftentimes when I see patients from malnutrition from other etiologies, we predict their resting energy expenditure using equations and we come up with their calorie goals. However, in cirrhosis, these equations have been shown to underestimate their requirements. So what do we do? So in this population, resting energy expenditure should be measured using indirect calorimetry if it's available but not predicted. So what do we do for everybody else? Well, there's extensive literature measuring resting ex energy expenditure using indirect calorimetry in patients with cirrhosis, and they've demonstrated energy expenditures from 20 to 38 kilocal per kilogram per day. So that's how we come up with the nutrition requirements in cirrhosis. And so there's two pillars, there's provision of calories and provision of protein. So as we mentioned earlier, these patients have altered glucose metabolism. They have enhanced gluconeogenesis. Their body is trying to produce more glucose to meet increased need and reduce glycogenolysis so they can't access their stores. And so this puts them in a state of starvation. So rather than glucose being their primary mode of energy, there's a transition to metabolism-free fatty acids. And all of this to say that it increases their resting energy expenditure, their total energy expenditure, and their total need for kilocal per kilogram per day. So you want to push for this 28 to 38 kilocal per kilogram per day with an ideal goal of about 35. And if you compare that to the average American, it's about 25 to 30 um, kilocal per kilogram per day. So it's substantially more. Now, when it comes to protein, again, because these patients are glucose deficient, they can't access their glucose stores, they're breaking down protein, and they also have reduced protein synthesis. Now, all of this leads to a negative nitrogen state and enhanced need for gram per kilogram of protein a day. So you want to shoot for about 1.2 to 1.5 gram per kilogram a day. And again, compare that to the average American who's closer to about 0.8. And when you're doing your calculations, there's a few things you want to consider. The first one is, are they third spacing? And if the patient has ascites, you really want to be using their dry weight. And you can do that by measuring their weight after a paracentesis, or you can subtract the percent total body weight from based on their ascites severity. So 5% for mild, 10 for moderate, 15 for severe. Now, I do want to talk about protein restriction. Um, in the setting of nutrition and encephalopathy, patients don't benefit from protein restriction. And you can understand why, if they're already in a state of protein catabolism and reduced protein synthesis, it will worsen outcomes. I do want to talk about branch chain amino acid supplementation it, from a nutrition standpoint. And so the branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, valine, are decreased in cirrhosis. And the theory is that supplementation would reduce protein turnover. But this has kind of remained controversial from a nutrition standpoint. And overall, there's not a, a significant enough effect on nutritional parameters. And these products tend to be more expensive and, than conventional foods and nutrition supplements. Uh, in that same vein, you may be asked about hepatic enteral formulas in the ICU patient on tube feeds. And again, these formulas are rich in branch chain amino acids. And again, there's really not a whole lot of data to support their use from a nutritional standpoint. They tend to be expensive and difficult for some centers to obtain. Um, and we'll talk about where you could consider this in the future. In terms of type of protein, several studies show the benefit of vegetable um, followed by dairy-based protein aside from cheese diets. They tend to more of a positive nitrogen balance compared to red meat. Um, there's limited evidence, again, how this impacts malnutrition. So the way I think of it is that patients should be encouraged to consume protein from diverse sources and whatever is in keeping with their availability, their means, what they can afford, and what's accessible to them. I do want to talk about timing of nutritional intake. We really want to avoid um, times of prolonged fasting, because this can worsen underlying glucose metabolism and protein catabolism. 
So provision of a late evening meal may decrease the catabolic state and result in an improvement in nitrogen balance and fat-free mass. This trial, um, looking at 103 patients with cirrhosis, patients were randomized to receive either daytime or nighttime supplementary nutrition of 710 kilocal uh, per day and 26 grams of protein, so essentially two ensure bottles over a 12-month period. And their primary outcome was total body protein. And what they saw was that provision of nighttime feed to patients with cirrhosis resulted in body protein accretion of about two grams of lean tissue that was sustained over 12 months. All this to say that you should consider a small frequent meals during the day, high protein, complex carb, evening snack to reduce fasting. An example of things that you could suggest would be a peanut butter sandwich, cereal with milk, um, nothing too complicated. When it comes to micronutrient um, deficiency should be assessed at least annually, repleted if deficient, and reassessed after repletion. I tend to start patients that I'm concerned about malnutrition on an oral supplement, and it you know, it's fairly inexpensive and low risk. A caveat is to ensure that you avoid supplementation with iron or copper until you've ruled out hemochromatosis and Wilson's disease. And patients with cholestatic or biliary etiologies are particularly increased risk for fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies. From the inpatient setting, um, I often will recommend a nutrition or dietary consult within 24 hours. Um, or have the screening tool administered by the primary or consulting team. It's gonna be really important to address and identify barriers to oral intake, fasting time, nausea, encephalopathy. The biggest barrier tends to be the NPO status. So if patients are NPO, consider you know, this 5% dextrose IV solution for short-term protein sparing and uh, prevention of hypoglycemia. Oftentimes, patients that are unable to meet nutrition targets by just oral intake are recommended to start oral nutrition supplements. And one thing that's, I think, big in the hospital is delayed food delivery. So having uh, additional supplements bedside for when you know meals are delayed. And patients that fail oral diet and supplementation, um, having a calorie count and starting enteral nutrition within 72 hours of hospital, ad hospital admission um, can be useful. Studies have shown a reduction in mortality and infectious morbidity in early enteral nutrition versus delayed or standard of care. I do want to mention a few things uh, when it comes to encephalopathy. Um, we know that patients do not benefit from a protein restriction and overall intake should remain high. Another concept, as we talked about before, is to favor plant-based sources over animal, um, given the larger production of nitrogen. So and then avoiding uh, prolonged times of fasting and encouraging small frequent meals and a late evening um, high protein complex carbohydrate snack. Uh, there's a couple additional things that are uh, people are studying. Branch chain amino acid supplementation is one of them. It is controversial. Um, some people, you know, do use it, but the only use would be really an outpatient setting. Now, zinc deficiency is common and possibly implicated. Um, and you also want to consider mental status changes associated with other deficiencies and other vitamins and replete as appropriate. One thing to consider is when you do place patients on long-term zinc, you can induce a copper deficiency. So you want to be trending trace metals, uh, which use similar transport molecules to ensure you don't cause additional issues. Fiber supplementation or probiotics may alter gut flora ammonia production. This is not ready for prime time. Um, we still need adequate studies just to show clinical benefit. In summary, malnutrition is common in cirrhosis. Patients should undergo screening with increased calorie and protein goals. Small frequent meals during the day with high protein complex carbohydrate evening snacks should be recommended. And nutrition planning should be administered by a multidisciplinary team, including PCP, hepatologist, dietitian, and exercise physiologist or physical therapist based on what's available at your center. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks very much. I gather you took the red eye flight to come out here after a lot of trouble. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So Marina and Jen, can you come up here? So we're hoping to have a robust discussion. Uh, uh, so Bob, uh, you have a question. Uh, you're getting ready to go to the microphone. I want to ask Jen this question. 
Jen, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, if I recall, uh, you had published a paper looking at MAL plus frailty index, and that might be a better predictor of mortality outcomes. So to that end, um, uh, how do you use frailty index uh, when you evaluate a patient for liver transplant? Do you use that to kind of rule in or rule out a candidate? Uh, do you have some expectations? What do you do at San Francisco? Thanks for the question, Raj. Um, so in the paper, we actually uh, demonstrated that frailty is, is the equivalent to adding nine meld sodium points to a patient's mortality risk. So a patient with a meld sodium of 15, who might be just, you know, looks like a normal patient in clinic sometimes, um, ultimately has a mortality risk in the in the mid-20s. So that's what we described in the paper. Now, when it comes to assessing um, the, the patient for liver transplantation, we keep MELD and frailty separate. There's no combined MELD frailty index. And we did, we've done that very intentionally because MELD represents the factors that are going to go away with transplant. It represents just all that sort of liver dysfunction. And so when you replace the liver, you get rid of MELD. You know, MELD just becomes, it disappears. Whereas frailty doesn't do that. Sure, some of the frailty that you see in the patient is related to their liver dysfunction, but a lot of it is related to their diabetes, their advancing age, and a lot of that sarcopenia is not going to get better after transplant. And so I think it's very important to treat them as separate indices. Um, we use frailty um, using the LFI as another factor in our global assessment. So in the same way that you use hemoglobin in A1C, you use the results from the, the echocardiogram, you use their left heart cath, you bring in frailty using a standardized index into that assessment. So for example, a patient who is 30 with PSD, compensated PSC, who comes in frail, we don't end up even looking. We don't talk about their liver frailty index because that 30 year old is going, you know, we, we believe that they have enough physiologic reserve that does not factor into their decision, into the decision making. Similar, a similar patient who's now 70 and has 20 years of diabetes and has, you know, some non-obstructing coronary artery disease um, and other factors then, and then comes in as frail. That is the patient where we say, okay, this was an, another objective hit to this patient um, and, and the, uh, another risk factor for poor outcomes after transplant. So that's really how we bring in frailty. Great. Bob, you had a question? I had three questions. First for Jen Jennifer, that was great as usual. Um, wanted to ask about telemedicine and assessing frailty because 80% 80, 80 of my oh, practice worried. is by telemedicine. What can I do in two minutes to figure that out? We would recommend that using the Telefi, T-E, L-F-I, um, which is going to come out hopefully if it gets accepted in the next month or two, um, which actually, so we did, we did a study um, where we did LFI, the actual in-person LFI in clinic, and then we took them to a separate room, put them on Zoom, and we did all these assessments on, um, uh, on Zoom, and we did some, you know, statistical jiggering, and we came up with the Telefi, which is going to be, uh, well, it depends on what, how much you want to do, but it looks like it's just the DASI, the Duke Activity Status Index Survey, plus or minus one question from SARCAF, which is basically, can you stand up from a chair? Okay. Um, however, you get added predictive value if you add DASI plus SARCAF, plus or minus SARCAF, but if you add virtual chair stands. So if the patient is able to stand up and sit sit down from the chair and you can time them on video, um, you get added value. So we we're probably going to move that direction where we start, uh, we'll start generating a lot more data around using the Telefi, but I think virtual chair stands and an objective standardized assessment of how much activity they're doing using the DASI um, might work. Thank you. And then two fast nutrition questions. It was a great talk. I love this. Magnesium. Every patient I see comes in on magnesium oxide, and I've never seen in 30 years magnesium oxide fix any magnesium deficiency. So I've been using mag plus protein, same thing with zinc, either people aren't on zinc or they're not taking enough. seems like magnesium and zinc could help with this nutrition and frailty issue, but what's the right supplement? I think that's a, that's a really good question. Um, that's a really good question. 
I think a lot of it has to do with checking levels and repleting and reassessing. Um, I often do see patients are just on supplements for a really long time and no one has checked levels, whether they're adequate, inadequate. So I think it's correlating deficiencies with like clinical disease. And um, I tend to just keep them on a general multivitamin. And then if they're particularly deficient in magnesium or zinc, then I'll add an additional. But I always check, like I mentioned, um, if I do maintain someone on zinc, I will check copper levels and zinc levels at periodic intervals to just ensure I'm not inducing any new issues. So, okay, I'm sorry here. Okay. A question for Dr. Lai. Uh, that was certainly very compelling data about uh, muscle mass and testosterone supplementation. Are we at all concerned about the drug induced liver injury in testosterone use? Uh, you mean hepatotoxic potential hepatic? Um, so that hasn't been that hasn't been borne out in the studies that are that have been published. There haven't been very many. There was that ran one randomized clinical trial, um, and we haven't seen any cholesterol or any other drug drug induced liver injury. So, and then in my practice, when I have used it, I haven't used it a lot, but I do do it in in um, uh, in co management with the endocrinologist. I haven't seen drug induced liver injury happen. So I would say the short answer is no. Yeah, uh, Janet, can I follow up with another question? So uh, I try to use androgel uh, as a cream to try and help these people build a muscle mass, but I've had pushback from insurance companies approving it. Uh, uh, you have any experience to relate? Uh, I don't have experience because I actually do send them to endocrine okay. for it. I mean, even if you, if you um, yeah. document the low testosterone level, they've been yes. pushing back. No, uh, not uh, I've not uh, used that to kind of prescribe. Yeah. It's just that people who have just decreased muscle mass. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Patients. No, you, yeah. you would. I, I mean, I, I think the way I have done it is I, I actually measure their testosterone. Right. It has to be done at 9 a.m., you know, in the morning because if okay. there's a diurnal variation. So I do get, um, my, my patients have been getting access okay. to testosterone in the setting of low testosterone Good. levels. Oh, great idea. Good. Question there? <laughs> Hi, uh, wonderful session. I had a, a testosterone question and some nutrition questions. The testosterone, is there any evidence that improves patient well-being? Would it be a palliative measure as well as just a muscle building measure? Oh, great idea. Um, yeah, actually, I think it, that Sinclair study from 2016, if I recall correctly, there was one quality of life metric on there that improved. I, I, I actually just can't remember what it was. So um uh, I would imagine it does. And I think that'd be a great idea to incorporate into some of the palliative care measures. Um, I will say from anecdotal experience, it is the easiest thing to measure. It is the easiest thing for my men to go to the, I never get pushback. They just want to ask, when can I go to the lab to measure it? Oh, I, I, I don't, I can't eat before it. That's okay. I mean, it is the, you get 100% compliance. Thank you. And then, so do you have another question? I had another oh, nutrition question. Okay. Um, one of them to talk about the nutrition. Um, two questions. One, you know, 28 to 38, um, what, what is it? Grams per kilogram per day. There's a ton of kilocalories per kilogram. It's a ton of food, right? Um, I probably couldn't eat that much if I was trying really hard. If I have ascites, if I have portal hypertension, what chance do I have? One. And then two, given that we're giving these patients lactulose and, you know, kind of provoking faster motility, how much is actually getting absorbed of what these patients are eating? Yeah, that's a really good question. It is a lot of calories. And so part of my clinic, I see mal a malnutrition a set of patients and it's really hard for them. So you have to figure out where they're at calorie. So I always, they always come in with a three-day calorie count before they see me. And then it's a slow transition upwards. So we do like an increase of 500 every time we meet with the hopes of one, wherever they're able to get, whatever they're cl uh, close enough to get to that goal. But you're absolutely right because they have so many limitations there. It's hard to get them to those types of goals, even with protein, you know, again, it's a slow goal. We start where they're at and then we slowly work our way up. They're limited by so many things. You know, they have early satiety, they have pretty severe ascites and the worse their liver disease is, the harder it is to get them to that goal. So it is definitely a problem to that we have to acknowledge. And I find that the more touch points they have with you or a nutrition provider, and I usually alternate, the more likely they are to succeed. So follow-up question, you know, as our patients have cirrhosis, encephalopathy, they say they're eating and you know, clearly they're not. So at what 
time point do you trigger dropping an NG tube? This is a discussion that I have on rounds all the time. The surgeons seem to do a much better job than the medicine folks. So uh, what triggers dropping an NG tube down to feed them? Yeah, so for, and particularly also continuing that as an outpatient. Yeah, so for me, in terms of inpatient setting, I always have them do a calorie count. It's it, always done. It, and they yeah. say, we'll give them a try. And you know, it's and not it's happening. Not gonna, yeah. It's not happening. It's Let's true. be realistic. You know, yeah. uh, it, it's not happening. Yeah. So I said, drop the NG tube day one. I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So I usually wait till about day three, but um, but you're right. And, and even the calorie counts are highly inaccurate, as you know, yeah. because yeah. food either doesn't come or it comes and they don't report it. So you're right. It, it is a hard kind of line to draw. Yeah. So, well, anyway, so Marina, I want to keep you engaged. Uh, so it, it's not uncommon, you know, when you're around, uh, you know, there's a patient who's on the transplant list, comes in with an infection, goes into multi-organ failure. And then you say, let's have a family meeting. The patient's not a candidate for transplant. And, 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 and you know, families don't accept that readily. So when should the discussion start happen about this being an event that may evolve? I mean, should that be part of our curriculum, you know, practice? You know, what do we do? I mean, it seemed like it's, it's a huge hole there and, and um, uh, it needs to be addressed. How do you yeah, approach that? Well, I have kind of maybe an unpopular nickname that Diane, our inpatient nurse, gave me. I don't know if I'm allowed to say it. And it, it's not a joke, but Dr. Death. But that's just, that's because um, when I start to see that a patient's trajectory ha is changing, I start talking to the house staff about involving palliative care early and often. So I think it is okay to come to the family and frame the situation as this is the path that we've been going on, but there's been a serious change. Um, and you may know the outcome of the new trajectory, or you may not. So I think you should set up a meeting where, again, you ask for permission to have a serious discussion. You ask them what they understand about the situation. Then you fill in the gaps to say, okay, now he's on dialysis and he's 67 and he's frail. He's no longer a candidate for, not a candidate for liver kidney. He's no longer a candidate for a liver just because we just do not think that he would recover. Things have changed. And then you say, what do you think? And then it's a tough conversation. And then you say, here's what I think could be worst case, worst case scenario. And here's what I think is the likely scenario. This is where you have to put your money down and actually be brave and say what you think is the more likely scenario and then let them process. And it doesn't all have to happen in one day. I do engage palliative care as a consult early. Um, and they're very good at these family meetings and they run the discussion, and then they involve you and say, here's your turn to update patients on their status. It's very hard when you've been following a patient for a very long time and the trajectory changes. That's what I think is the most challenging. Milt, you had a good question. Um, in the discussions that we had, there was no mention of other sources of protein. Plant-based, it's preferable, but we know we can't get enough into them. And we don't want to have much red meat. What about fish and poultry? Where do they fit in this scheme? Absolutely. I think I, I completely agree with you. And I think it, when it comes to nutrition, it's important to meet them where they're at and understanding what their dietary pattern is and encouraging them to enhance that. So if someone is predominantly not a vegetarian, having them eat hundred percent plant-based is not practical. So for them, your goal is to switch to leaner meats. That's eggs, chicken, fish, um, turkey, and just less red meat is kind of the, the goal to transition. Sometimes you'll find people who don't have access to that type of food. So in that case, from a nutrition standpoint, it's whatever they can access to keep their protein goals up. And tuna fish or white fish, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, benefits and 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 risks to canned food in, in this patient population. But again, if that's what they can afford, then that's, you know, to keep their overall protein goals up, that's okay. Um, 
but I have vegetarian patients and they're able to meet their veg their protein intake from vegetarian goals too. So um, it's just kind of understanding yeah, what the dietary pattern is and meeting the patient where they're at to get them to the goal. Unfortunately, it's not often that we meet with success. Yeah. Okay. Marina, you had a comment? I had a comment about a quality improvement intervention that I'm sure our hospital could benefit from and think about this in your own hospital. How much time do our patients with cirrhosis spend NPO for procedures that they may or may not need or procedures that will or will not be done or will they get bumped? We've had patients go for EGDs at 5 p.m. and they're basically starving or it's rescheduled and then they're starving again for 72 hours. So thinking about is this a problem at your hospital? And this is an intervention you can easily do where all cirrhosis patients have to go early in the morning. And there are some other things that you can do, but please don't starve your patients and try to exercise them while they're in the hospital. Well, on that note, oh, I'm sorry, this one final question there. Go ahead. Quick, short questions. So first, congratulations. Fantastic presentations, all three of you. So my question is for Dr. Lai. And we first you the comment you made, which is great. We know this, that TIPS may have a significant benefit in improving frailty. But on the other hand, we know that sarcopenia is also an independent predictor of death after TIPS. So how do you balance that risk and also the risk of increasing cephalopathy with the potential benefit? And is that a point of no return where the patient might be too frail or sarcopenic to benefit from TIPS where it may cause more harm? That's a great question. I am dying to look at that using the um, a, a multi-center data set. Um, so we need the answer to that question. Exactly. Um, so great question. I, at this point, really encourage my, my, in my own practice and my colleagues to not wait to that point of no return. I think it's, at, we, we do know that sarcopenia can, muscle mass can improve after, but a patient who gets a tips is, does not so well. So it, it's about not waiting until, oh, the next time they come in or the next time they have a bleed, the next, you know, let's see if we can, you know, up the diuretics to see if their ascites will resolve, you know, and they're getting 10 liters out, right? And so it, 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 it's sort of a message for us to say we shouldn't be waiting until they're completely cachectic before we talk about tips. That we should we should talk if we can find kind of that right moment where we see them slow starting to to get frail. Um, it, when they're more pre-frail or we start the transition in frailty, then we can say, okay, this person is just going to a point of no return. Is going to become frail in two months if we don't take action now. Well, on that note, we shall end the session. I really would like you all to give a nice round of applause to this great team. A great session, indeed. Thank you so much. Marcelo, some final words? So maybe more than you, I am... Uh in a rush to not get in the way of uh, myself and lunch. Um, but uh, let me just say congratulations to all the speakers. That was a very strong start to our meeting. Um, Liver Connect is uh, getting to be a long meeting. And so, uh, you know, we need to pace ourselves. Enjoy. There's a little bit of a break this afternoon. Uh, we're going to have uh, a great talk by Dr. Choi on... Uh, uh, PBC, and then Dr. Persopoulos and I hopefully will add some uh, work on hepatorenal syndrome uh, later on tonight. Uh, a couple of thoughts. Uh, clearly, there's so much more that we can do for our patients. I'm a little bit overwhelmed by how much I can still add to the clinical care that we give. And I would like to start thinking about uh, even having uh, sort of like a multidisciplinary approach within the same clinic and introducing all these uh, touches with the patient in chronic care codes uh, for liver disease. Um, and I think that that is something that we need to explore and talk more about because we should probably be uh, trying to connect with these patients several times a month in different aspects of their care. We definitely need to stop doing... Um, the uh, disjointed care that we do, I was reassured to hear from Dr. Brown that in New York, like in Colorado, everybody gets a CT scan, but not a paracentesis when they go to the emergency room. And, you know, we all have the same problems. I was thinking about, 
we check glucoses now on a constant basis. Could we check creatinines on a constant basis through a transdermal approach and so that we can act early and start these patients on the right treatment? And clearly, if we use albumin early, clearly, if we treat hepatorenal dysfunction early in whichever way, uh, we're going to be able to save a lot of uh, a lot of people. And so there's so much more that we can do. So this is a strong start to the meeting. I invite you to participate as we did this morning through, throughout the next few days and enjoy lunch. Thank you.